Go ahead, you guys. Today, we're going to talk about Ryan Ferguson and Chuck Erickson. They were arrested for murder in 2001, I believe. Greg, tell us about the videos we're going to watch. Yeah, these two videos are simply interviews with the police department in Columbia, Missouri. And these guys have been brought in because one of them, two years after the murder, was reading a newspaper case and remembered being in that area earlier that same morning. It was Halloween night late and started to think, well, maybe it was me. And so mentioned it to a friend. There was a sketch that looked a little bit like him. The friend called the police. And here's what we're going to see. This is what bothers me. Sometimes things go horribly, horribly wrong. Yeah, I know where you're going. Just the thing about it is, if they're going to get you with it, if they're going to pin this on you, you know, you might as well get it. If that's going to happen regardless, and it you know, looks like they got all this stuff and all this evidence, if they're going to pin it on you, you might as well get it pinned on you for the right reasons. Yeah, that's exactly what I said to you earlier, man. I didn't, oh my God. You're trying to get me to admit to something I didn't do. I didn't do it. I mean, set me down and wait until trial, man. Just take me down to jail because I didn't do anything. I'm not being with something do you I didn't think, do. do you, I understand. But do you think that if you, do you think if you go down to jail and buy, you know, a lot of times when we talk to people, they think, you know, if I just maintain my, that I didn't do it, I didn't do it. That it's all going to go away? You think no, it's going to go away? I know if I did something, they would know that I did it. Okay. All right? Yeah. I'm innocent. Because okay, so you're innocent of killing this guy. I'm innocent of even being there. I'm not involved in this in any way. All right? It's all mean that it's, it's the truth. There's nothing I can do or say about that to make it different. I mean, I haven't, I mean, my hope is that I don't have any hope now. I'm going to jail for something I didn't do. I'm not going to admit to doing it to get a lesser sentence because I didn't do it. But if it didn't go down just the way this guy's saying, why should you take the rap or something? something because I don't have a choice. I don't have a choice, man. I'm telling you what happened. I'm telling you what happened. But what if you still had the choice to tell your side of the story and it wasn't exactly like what this, whatever this other guy's saying was? Then, why not? But, but I want to be straight up with you, man. I really don't appreciate you coming here and doing this. All right, I told them the truth. All right, no matter what, that is the truth. That's what happened. All right, I'm, I'm not hoping that anything changes. I'm hoping that they realize that I didn't have anything to do with it. I'm hoping that the evidence will prove that I didn't do it. They're not, though. They don't believe you. Well, I mean, that sucks. Taking it to court. I mean, I have to go to trial, dude. I, I didn't do anything. And I'm not going to admit to doing something I didn't do. Can't do or say anything else about it. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a really interesting start to an interrogation or whatever this is. If I'm asking you who's trying to convince who in this room, who would you say? I would say it's a guy who sounds like Jerry Seinfeld going, you ever notice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it the police officers asking questions with an upward tone or making statements with an upward tone constantly? If we just take tone for a minute, Ryan, the suspect, is telling and telling hard. No, I didn't do it. He's emphatic with his body language. He's emphatic with his words. He's emphatic with his voice. He's emphatic with everything he's doing. In fact, the only times we see him not emphatic is when he's hopeless, when he says, well, I'm hopeless. And he shows that with his body language. The other interesting piece, I look for congruency when a person uses choice of words. That's diction or that's verbal. They're vocal where their voice is making the same sounds or in a downward telling tone. Their cadence is correct. Their pitch is correct. And then I look for nonverbals and all that body language of those exposed fingers extended out and driving his point when he tries to make it. It's powerful. It shows if I were sitting across the room, this guy going to tell the boss, hey, boss, I, I don't think this guy did it just based on that. There's one thing he does that might make this guy jump on him, and that's when he rubs his thighs. So we see an adapter. But what do we always tell you? There are no signs of deception, only signs of stress and you look for clusters. The cluster's simply not there. I could go on, but I'm gonna leave some of this alone. One of the things that I would, oh, look, two things I gotta cover here. You, how often have you heard us talk about punishment question? This guy didn't wait for the question. He says, I guess I'm going to jail, but I'm not guilty. You don't hear people say, take me to jail and let me go to court. It is a very American thing, very American thing to say, give me my day in court. We are always the people who say, I'll take it to the Supreme Court with no idea even what that means. This is right off to a start of this kid looking innocent to me. Uh, Chase, what do you got? I got pretty much the same. 
<clears throat> so I wake up around 4.30 every day. I'm downstairs watching these uh, in Jamaica, where I'm at today. And I had no idea what this was. And just watching this first 30 seconds, I, within 30 seconds, I was already maybe biased. But I, within that 30 seconds, I'm like, this is probably an innocent person. Here's a list of things that guilty people will do most often. They'll reassert their character and motive. They'll retell the story again. They'll add details to the story. They'll attempt to help the police. They'll ask questions about evidence. They'll ask what other people have said. They'll return uh, to the backstory and details that prove that they are innocent. Truthful people will behave in a very different way. They will ascertain and com continue to assert their innocence. There's uh, anger response. There's an immediate denial. There's continued and increasingly firm denials. There's unchanging story without the need to return to it. Unflinching confidence that no proof exists, which you definitely see in this video. And then one thing that you'll see in innocent people is confusion. You don't see a lot of confusion in people who know damn well why they're in that room. So the confusion plays an important part. So here, all of his gestures are so perfectly timed with his words. I know Scott's going to probably talk about this. And that I would say this, with all the other behaviors we're observing, is enough to convince me, knowing nothing about this case whatsoever, not that he's really innocent, but that something is definitely definitely off here and he looks innocent to me just watching this video and knowing nothing about it uh scott what do you got uh yeah i'm with you in the in the first 30 seconds and greg had called me um after that and he's like well what do you think i said well, i haven't watched yet after my 30 seconds i was i should uh, i had to wash my mouth i was pretty angry let's say because i could see where this was going this guy never says tell me what the detective never says tell me what happened he never says how did you get here he doesn't say he doesn't ask him anything like that at all. He goes in to aggressive mode. He's not as aggressive as, as we're going to see in a little while, but he gets a little bit uh, more than aggressive there. He's doing this wrong. He's doing it wrong. Every, you, we get a lot of comments. She also uh, uh, bad confession. So also, she also has a false confession. You're looking at not this one, but in the next one, we'll be seeing plenty of that. Now, for the body language for, uh, for Ryan, He's not closed off. He's not in any kind of confession mode whatsoever. He's not having any kind of inner dialogue. He's not prepping his answers up here, thinking when that question comes in, he's not thinking. And then he's just answering in this free flow of information. There's no delay. There's no nothing in there. When you're analyzing uh, an interrogation or an interview, like, like in, this, in this case, when we do that, you always hear me say, well, one of the things that he or she didn't say was, wait a minute, I didn't do it. Hang on just a second, which is what you hear when the person di didn't do it. That's all this guy's saying the whole time. I didn't do it. It wasn't me. I'm innocent because this. I'm innocent because that. I didn't do it. He's frustrated. We see him get frustrated. Sorry, I'm getting worked up. So this guy's doing it wrong. He's using, he, a lot, I've got a thousand dollars that said a long time ago, he, he took the single course of the read technique and probably went through to the advanced thing, but he's forgotten how to use it. The great thing about the read technique, it's got specific steps you use, but you use those, you, you mold them to fit you and that situation. You go in with the assumption that the person did it quite often. You do. I don't do that every time when I'm using it, but that's one of the, 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 they say to do that. You know, that's, that's the big thing you go in on attack. In this case, this guy's doing it wrong. He's, he's, you can see some of the steps he's following. I'll point them out as we go through this, but he shouldn't be doing it this way. He's not listening. He's, he's, he acts like he knows for sure this kid is guilty. And I didn't, I don't think he was, I mean, I, uh, apparently he's, he's been let out or something, but I don't think he was. I'm going to watch that, that Netflix thing and and see what, what all happens with this. Mark, what do you got? Today's video is sponsored by Aura. I'm excited for this because I've been using this app for over two years. If you didn't know how much private information is out there on the Internet about you, when you first see it, it's pretty shocking and maybe a little disturbing. These people that collect all these private things about you are called data brokers. But there's a secret here. 
They have to take down your information if you ask them to. So they make it incredibly hard to do. So what we do is let Aura handle that for us. And you can do the same. You can let Aura do all the work tracking down and removing all the stuff that you don't want online. And you can try Aura for two weeks for free using the link uh, right at the top of the description down there. And Aura does a ton more than just getting your information off the internet. They protect you from threats that you and even your kids can't see coming. And it's super easy to set up. You don't have to go download a million different apps to get all the benefits that Aura has, like parental controls, antivirus, VPN software, password management. They even have identity theft insurance, everything. One of my friends was over here sitting in this office just a week ago, and I typed his name in, and within just a few minutes, we found everything. Even his anonymous accounts were on the dark web and the passwords associated with those. He downloaded Aura that night. So you should look into this. Your private information should be private. You can go to Aura.com slash TBP, just like the behavior panel, TBP, right now to start a free two-week trial that I've also linked down in the description. Uh, yeah, so look, if you like and you subscribe, then you'll know that we watch a lot of videos of interrogations. And so between us, we've seen a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, and done some as well, obviously. And this one just jumps out completely. Within a few seconds of this, I was thinking, why are we doing, why are we looking at this? What's going on here? What are we looking at here? Because nothing about it says right from moment one that we're liable to have somebody who's done anything. Why? What's happening here? Oh, number one, Greg, you were saying, look, if I was sitting across from this guy, well, this guy isn't sitting across from this guy. This guy's almost sitting on top of him. It's almost like he's been paid for a dance. It's it's so close already from moment one that I already go, what's going on here? Why are you so close into his territory to the point where you're already intimidating? I would say that proximity is already intimidating, which suggests you don't want information out of this person. You want to intimidate them from moment one. That we've not really seen, I don't think, anywhere else in any of the videos that we've looked at, that level of very fast, quick intimidation. So it already jumps um, out. Uh, just to agree with everybody, the subject here gives many, many, many clear denials that you just don't see very often. Such clarity of denial, such repetition of denial, and the alibi of, I just wasn't there. I wasn't there. That's a good alibi. I wasn't there. Uh, now, what's happening with the interviewer here? The, the interviewer is narrowing down the options already for this person. The interviewer isn't interested in um, in in what else were you doing? Where else were you? The interviewer is interested in narrowing down the options on being guilty. How would you best like to be guilty in this? Not are you guilty, are you not? How would you best like to admit your guilt on this? So already narrowing down the options to the point where the subject very quickly gets into a situation of, of what I would call futility and says, I don't have any hope. If you manage to get somebody that quickly into a point of no hope, there's something quite extreme going on, I would suggest. Uh, where's the lawyer in this case? I mean, another great case of whether you're guilty or innocent, but especially if you're innocent, don't answer any questions. Get a lawyer before you say anything. Your only conversation should be, uh, I'll be getting a lawyer. Where's my lawyer? Is my lawyer here yet? That's That's all. That's all you need to be talking about. The other thing I'll say, look, lots of lots of open palm gestures at naval height. That doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's being honest, but it's very continuous with this person. It doesn't deviate a great deal from that. So that's a good indicator. Um, and who's the most engaged in this situation? Who looks like, I mean, I know we have one person who vocally is doing those upward inflections, those Seinfeld inflections of, of um, you know, will you join in on this? Will you join in on my story? But still very relaxed and disengaged with it. Whereas the other, the, the subject is really, is upright in the chair and engaged with, with, telling the truth as they see it, which which isn't a big, you know, a, a big bunch of detail. It's like, I wasn't there. 
I'm not there. I'm nothing to do with this. This is quite interesting because it's very different from what we would normally see. Uh, let's have another. Uh, well, just so you know, and in, in, go ahead. Oh, you're talking about the seating. No, I was going to talk about a couple other things. Number one, this kid got out of jail 10 years later and has had a multi-million dollar lawsuit settlement for being wrongfully imprisoned. And there's this case is really messy. It's worth going and looking at the details. And you guys who know this this thing, we're happy for you to make comments down below. We, you know, we don't always get all the facts right on this because we're paying attention to the interrogation. And go ahead and see, see my next yeah. one. Yeah. Um, yeah, what I was going to say is in interrogation, it's okay to get sort of close. That guy is a little bit too close, but he's not real close because he's leaning back a lot and doing all that. It, quite often what I'll do is I don't I don't sit across the table. I sit next to him, not right next to him, but it's okay to be that close in case you need to reach out. But when you do, we usually scooch up a little bit. Um, just just to put a little clarity. Well, hey, look, let's, let's keep the interrogation thing for one second. And each okay. of us make a comment because for me, this is all wrong right off. This guy's going in without any information gathering whatsoever. He doesn't look at the guy. He's going in with an intent. You talk about Reed. Look, I come from the intelligence interrogation world where we also get into confessions because of the nature of what we collect. But our first intent is information. I always say it's much more important to us to find out where the bad guys came from so we can find more bad guys than worrying about the one we have in our hands. And when you're in a war, that matters how much of this and that exist. We don't always even know who we're talking to. We have to clarify that up front before we get to that level of detail. So it's a very different mindset. And if you don't know how to use read, you can certainly force a bad memory into somebody's head. Mm. I feel my face getting hot. One of those tape replays. Sometimes things go horribly, horribly wrong. Yeah, I know where you're going. Just like that. Well, I know where I'm going. You might as well get it. If, if that's going to happen regardless, and, and I, you know, it looks like they got all this stuff and all this evidence, if they're going to pin it on you, you might as well get it pinned on you for the right reasons. Yeah, that's exactly what I said to you earlier, man. I didn't, oh my God. You're trying to get me to admit to something I didn't do. I didn't do it. I mean, set me down and wait until trial, man. Just take me down to jail because I didn't do anything. I'm not. Being is something do you think, do you, do you, I understand. But do you think that if you do you think if you go down to jail and buy you know, a lot of times when we talk to people they think, you know, if I just maintain my that I didn't do it, I didn't do it, that it's all gonna go away? Do you think no, I, I know if I did something they would know that I did it. Okay. Alright. Yeah. I'm innocent. Because you're innocent of killing this guy. I'm innocent of even being there. I'm not involved in this in any way. All right. That's all I mean. That it's it's the truth. There's nothing I can do or say about that to make it different. I mean, I have. I mean, my hope is that I don't have any hope now. I'm going to jail for something I didn't do. I'm not going to admit to doing it to get a lesser sentence because I didn't do it. But if it didn't go down just the way this guy's saying, why should you take the rap or something? something because I don't have a choice. I don't have a choice, man. I'm telling them what happened. I'm telling them what happened. But what if you still had the choice to tell your side of the story? And it wasn't exactly like what this, whatever this other guy's saying was. Then, Why not? But, but, I want to be straight up with you, man. I really don't appreciate you coming here and doing this. All right, I told them the truth. All right, no matter what, that is the truth. That's what happened. All right, I'm, I'm not hoping that anything changes. I'm hoping that they realize that I didn't have anything to do with it. I'm hoping that the evidence will prove that I didn't do it. They're not, though. They don't believe you. Well, I mean, that sucks. Taking it to court. I mean, I have to go to trial, dude. I, mean, I didn't do anything. And I'm not going to admit to doing something I didn't do. It. I can't do or say anything else about it. This is what bothers me. And, you know, when something happens that you make, you know, you make a mistake, people understand you don't really want to come out with it because we're ashamed. I understand that. Mm -hmm. And I've done other things. But this is definitely not one of those cases, man. I've not done anything. I've told them the truth. And all I can do is sit here and wait and have a million people try to talk me into saying I did something I did not. It's not fun. I guess I'm just trying to keep, I'd like to see you help yourself. I think you still can help yourself. 
Who do you think that is? No, I don't know what happened. You know? Well, look at this way, man. I didn't do it yourself. Okay. And the only way I can help myself is by admitting to something I didn't do. That's what you're saying. No, not really. That's exactly what you're saying. Let's say, for instance, this other fellow, uh, Chuck, let's say this was all something he, it was his idea. Let's say that he's trying to pin this whole thing on you because he paints a pretty bad picture. Well, maybe that, maybe he is, but I wasn't no. with him. I don't know anything about it. You think it would make it easier for him if you were able to, to come clean on what happened? I, 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 I am come clean, all right? But if you had, if you had, you think it would make it easier for your mom and dad? Your mom in particular? You said mom and well, dad. Well, if I had yes, but I had it. I don't know how many times I had to say this to you guys. I have not done anything. I was not there. I did not do anything. But if there was a way that you could help yourself, you'd do it. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm doing it. Okay. I'm doing it. I'm telling the truth, so I'm doing what I can. I mean, if you know what this is like, man, let me talk to my dad. Let me talk to my mom. So I get one phone call, man. I gotta call my dad to get water for you. I gotta call my mom so she had Chase, what do you got? There is, there are a few things wrong here from an interrogation perspective. So just looking through this lens, he's ignoring repeated denials. An interrogator shouldn't do that. Uh, there's a pressure being applied to help yourself that kind of implies a confession and not an emphasis at all on the truth. When the confession is more important than the truth, you will have a very bad interrogation. So if somebody believes the only way to improve their situation is by agreeing with an interrogator, there's a big problem. So it's also in introducing this alternative scenario, even after these denials. There's a denial of a request to speak with family. And in people this age, you got to be a little careful because they might be asking for legal help by asking it. Can I talk to my mom or my dad? Don't know how old this kid is, but then there's misinterpretation of cooperation. The police are interpreting this person. Him telling the truth or making denials is not cooperative. And this sets the stage for agreement being the only way out. Then there's a lack of clarity, like if there's a way that you can help yourself, would you do it? So these vague questions, just kind of, this is this is the interrogation version of the foot in the door technique. And there's genuine exasperation there. Uh, he is telling instead of selling this, the guy that we're looking at here, the suspect. There's one point in this clip, though, that he engages in real self-soothing behavior. And it's it's when he's talking about having to get lawyers fees from his dad. So way too often, I think interrogators are trained to get confessions instead of truth. I got called to do a concierge interrogation once uh, here in the U S for a major crime. And the head of the department asked me how fast I could get a confession out of the guy. And I asked him if he was paying me for a confession or the truth. And he said, all he wants is a confession. So I took my non-refundable deposit and went home. And the alleged suspect of that interview that I was supposed to do is free today. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. So look, I will go back to the the space being used here. There's a difference between using space in order to build a connection with somebody and using space to be territorially aggressive. So yeah, absolutely. If you come into within a hands, uh, an arm's distance of somebody, you're in what we'd call personal space. And of course you could be in that personal space and trying to create a connection, but you could also be in that personal space and taking that space and being intimidating. And just as you say there, Chase, it's kind of a foot in the door technique. I'd say again, we've got this guy lent back. So he doesn't look like he's proximate, but his hand is out at the corner of the table and taking up all of that space. That for me is not somebody trying to reach out and connect. That's somebody trying to take territory. And though you might want to do that towards the end of some kind of interview or some way through it as you've built rapport, I don't think this person is trying to build rapport at this point. I think he's trying to um, to use his use 
use his status and use his weight and and use the space to his advantage, not to negotiate with this other person in order to win information. Um, and so the stress is building up in this in this person being interviewed. And so we get we get a suppression gesture here, uh, you know, keeping keeping down the energy. So we've, we've got clearly got tension building up, which he's keeping down. And then he's self soothing on the front of his head with that. Again, that's an extreme gesture to see the moment the hands, no, you know, most of the time, if you get somebody with their hands on their head at some point, either, you know, somebody scored and then you realize, oh, it's been disallowed. And it's that it's the clear suppression of that energy uh, or, or some awful situation has happened. Uh, and some realization of that. It's extreme to go up here. And here we have it in this situation. So extreme territory being taken, extreme suppression going on. Again, not really seen that very much in in many of the interviews that we've ever looked at. Scott, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree with you. He's not trying to, to uh, connect with this guy at all. Not even a little bit. He's he's already decided what's going to happen, and that, that this guy's already guilty. He thinks this other guy is, is, is like has confessed everything. Apparently, he thinks that because he's going in so strong. He's not trying to do anything like that. I think we're seeing frustration. His he, we're seeing his hands through his hair. That's you know we'll do that when we're frustrated as well. Try or trying to get heat off of us as we heat up. It it is self soothing at the same time. It's an, adap an adapter, uh, and he's repeating the same thing over and over and over. And over, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. I don't know how he got this information. It wasn't me. This guy never says, then where were you that night? Tell me what led up to that night. Then why are you here? He doesn't say any of that. He's doing it wrong. I'm getting worked up. Sorry. So he, he's doing it wrong. So he starts that theoretical stuff. Well, uh, if you did do it and you want it to be end up better for you, and what wouldn't you want to do something that's good for yourself? If there's a way you could you could help yourself when you do it, of course he's going to say yeah. But what does he say? Yeah, I'm doing it. I'm doing it right now. I'm telling you, I didn't do it. I don't. It never does he say. Well, tell me what happened today. So you weren't there. No, I wasn't. Well, then where were you? Tell me about that. None of that. Greg, what do you got? Remember, this is two years after the fact, just one one key point. But let's list, I, I, my notes simply say read wrong, read wrong is all this is. And that means to both reads with the E, A, and the other way, <laughs> because he's not reading the person sitting in the chair. Not at all. Mm -hmm. If he were, he would notice defiance, defiance with that chin back and him saying innocent and throwing himself out of the chair almost at one point in this interview. There's a whole lot of things going on here. I, I, this is just proof you can't take a book and do this and run through the book and go check, 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 and be yeah. an interrogator. It is an art form. It is not an art form for the squeamish because you're going to fail and look stupid many times. And he's doing it really well right here in front of me, in my opinion, because what he's done is not heard a word this guy has said. So he's not reading him and he's not reading him. So let's just not say it's the read technique that's causing the problem, it's poor application. There've been many people who've gotten great, true confessions. When you're set out to get a confession and you've decided before you go in, which a lot of people who use read are before they go in, you're going to go in with a checklist mindset and a bias mindset, and that's what he's doing. This kid is defiant when he says, when he first comes up and he, he says, I understand that. Pretty damn defiant. And he touches his brow from stress. Well, there's a good indicator. We always say that means something. Yeah, it means something. It means he's stressed. If Mark, to your point, I guarantee you that if you didn't know me and you came in and sat down in the room and I came in and started interrogating you, you're going to feel stress because I'm going to make sure you feel some stress to see where it goes. But what he doesn't pay attention to is where this kid's emphasis is. By that, I mean, does his emphasis with his hands and his, and his vocal tone emphasize the th same things his words are doing. Do it, does it align? So when he touches his brow, that's one thing. He's doing gravity-defying extended finger movements constantly. The cop, on the other hand, tries to avoid the question when he starts asking, so what you're telling me, in a beautiful summary, what you're telling me is the only way to make my condition better is to lie to you and tell you I did it. The cop does his best to avoid that, and he doesn't allow him to. And one of the things we know, you know, I tell you all the time, you'll hear me talking about SEER because it's the most profound experience in psychology I've ever dealt with. Because you're 
under high duress talking to these people. And you have to be careful because we're training their brain, their limbic brain, their animal brain, their mammalian brain to respond. And when a person is in that heightened fight or flight and you're injecting information, how that memory got there is not clear to them. I think about the last time any of you were in an automobile accident and how shadowy those memories are. Well, if the memory got there because somebody put it in or the memory got there because it happened, can be difficult to determine. And he starts to inject his first piece of information to this kid under stress. And he's talking about them being there together. But the kid continues. It's one message. It's congruent and it's innocence. I, I, for the life of me, I don't know how a person gets to the point they don't look at the person they're interrogating. And look, we've all made mistakes. Everybody does. I'm not beating the guy. I'm beating the process. Somebody watching this video should have said, hey, did you notice this kid being so defiant? Did you notice? But this kid went to prison for 10 years and only was exonerated through work. I think it was an innocence project, but exonerated and let go from there. You should watch an interview with this kid on the morning news. He's got the most positive attitude of anybody I've ever seen. It's amazing. One of those tape replays. And you know, when something happens that you make, you know, you make a mistake, people understand you don't really want to come out with it because we're ashamed. I understand that. And I've done other things. But this is definitely not one of those cases. Man. I've not done anything. I've told them the truth. And all I can do is sit here and wait and have a million people try to talk me into saying I did something I did not. Not fun. I guess I'm just trying to keep you. I'd like to see you help yourself. I think you still can help yourself. Because you think I did it? I don't know what happened. You know? Well, look at this I didn't do it yourself. yourself. Okay. And the only way I can help myself is by admitting to something I didn't do. That's what you're saying. No, not really. That's exactly what you're Let's saying. say, for instance, this other fellow, uh, Chuck. Let's say this was all something he, it was his idea. Let's say that he's trying to pin this whole thing on you because he paints a pretty bad picture. Well, maybe that, maybe he is, but I wasn't yeah. with him. I don't know anything about it. You think it would make it easier for him if you were able to, to come clean on what happened? I am I, I, I I come clean, all right? But if you hadn't, if you hadn't, you think it would make it easier for your mom and dad? Your mom in particular? You said mom. Well, if I had that, I yes, but I had it. I don't know how many times I've just said this to you guys. I have not done anything. I was not there. I did not do anything. But if there's a way that you could help yourself, you'd do it. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm telling the truth, so I'm doing what I can. I mean, if you know what this is like, man, I'm going to talk to my dad. I talk to my mom. So I don't get one phone call, man. I gotta call my dad to get water for you. Like I gotta call my mom so she'll. Well, let me find out about all that. Thank you. Okay. This is what bothers me. Yeah, I like think you said I'd always want to kill someone before I was 60 anyway. What night was this that this that this happened out here at the Tribune? Was there a special occasion? It was Halloween, yeah. Halloween, okay. So that night, when you see Ryan choking out, do you think that Ryan was choking to make sure he was dead? Yeah. Now, did he say that, or is that just you thinking that? That's what I think. Okay. All right. Was there anything taken from the guy that we will know where it's at or we'll be able to find? I think his dad found the wallet. Ryan's dad found the wallet? Yeah, but I don't know. Okay. Not for certain on that? No. Okay. And what did you say earlier about what you thought he choked him with? Or it's possible you may have choked him with something, is that right? Yeah. But you don't know what it was? No. Okay. All right. There was obviously a lot of injuries to this guy, so it was, uh, it's pretty obvious that he was hit more than once, but you're not sure who did that, right? Yeah. So you, basically your feeling, or what you're recalling... I think I just blacked out. Okay. After you hit the guy and he went down, you see Ryan choking him. I mean, yeah. I mean, I blacked out in between when I hit the guy and, and when I see this lady, basically. Okay. But you did see Ryan choking him out? Yeah. Okay. All right. Hang on this for just a second. I'm going to try to find this Dallas guy. I'll be right back with you. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. Um, so, look, interesting one on the, by the, 
this is this is a different uh different subject uh it's a different person i had to have a good look uh as i was going through these and go hang on i, I we've changed we've changed subject here um chuck erickson chuck, chuck erickson. erickson yeah so the last guy was ryan this is yep. this is chuck um okay so so what do i notice immediately here the pulling up of the sleeves seems an odd an odd thing to do it's it's out of it's out of context with what he's talking about at the time and then his hand goes up to face block there something around i think his dad found a wallet i think his dad found a wallet so it seems to me i'm going to put an element of uncertainty around this whole wallet situation we'll see as we as we go on how much uncertainty there seems to be around a lot of stuff. But that initially jumped out to me. There's some uncertainty about what's being talked about here and 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 quite a big level of uncertainty. Um, now, th the difference here is, this, is the interviewer here is giving the subject way more space way more space so that's that's an interesting difference in the in the interview here we'll see him giving him way more space to talk and way more distance from from each other let's see how if this interview plays out any differently but first off it's a lot of uncertainty with the subject around what he's talking about uh greg what do you got on this one yeah, Mark, he may give him a lot of space, but he also gives him a lot of information. When I interrogate somebody, part of the way I know that they have done a thing is we have a thing called guilty knowledge. It may be what, you know, what happened at the site and nobody else would know. It may be what color shoes the guy was wearing because there's something odd. Any of that kind of weird thing, we would fish for that. We don't tell them that because the minute you tell them that, you have tainted the entire interrogation because now they're feeding you back information you feed them. And remember what I just said, under duress, under duress, when a person is feeling fight or flight and you're telling them things, it goes into shadowy memory. So here we have this guy is feeding information to the perpetrator, to the suspect in this case. And it's really interesting to watch because he's forced him into this situation. Now, these guys, I don't know. This is a longer interrogation than we have access to video. The videos we're watching is what we're basing it on. And this guy is open to saying, I was there. I did it. Look, he's he's saying, I, I was there. This is the guy who said he thought maybe because he blacked out, something happened. This is read wrong again, pressure and inject memories. His inserts. The first part's interesting is when the kid is saying uh, something about his friend had said he was going to kill somebody before 60. He's illustrating out of frame. Those of you who know me know that I say when you're illustrating out of frame, I'm suspicious of the facts. I want to ask, how do you know that? Where would you get the information that? He also says that's what I think, but it's not what he thinks when he says, I think that Ryan was trying to choke him to death. No, the guy just told you what to think because he asked you with a leading question, a bad question. Chase, was Ryan trying to choke that guy to death with the belt? That's a leading question. Of course, you're going to say yes. What do you think he wants to know? And he's under stress. There's also a couple of others. But my other favorite one is the cop swivels in the chair just before he goes in for something that seems like it's important. And he's, he backtracks when he said, you said that he choked him with something. And he goes, well, maybe you said it's possibly choked him with something. That's a bold move that he realizes maybe he made a mistake and he steps back. That's a good indicator something's going on. Let me give you just a handful of other things he's feeding him. Uh, he was hit more than once. You should never tell somebody that. You should say you hit him once and it killed him. No, no, I hit him 50 times. Then you know the guy's telling the truth. Uh, was choking to kill. Choke him and what he choked him with. Ryan was trying to kill him. He's feeding him this information. All of this is all fed directly to this guy. And how now do you have any idea what the guy really knew versus what you fed him under duress? Really tough. Now, Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah. The detective is just telling him what he did and this kid's agreeing with it. That's all that's really happening here. And it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And it, this kid must have said to himself, "Okay, I don't know. I don't know what happened. Here's what I, or that's what he's actually saying is I had, I had it. Uh, this is what I think might have happened. I'm not sure because yeah. I blacked out. And this, and this guy is just filling in what blacked out, and then he's agreeing with it. When it when it comes to police officers, my best friend, the whole wide world's a detective for 22 years, homicide detective. I don't have. I'm all for the police and the cops. I'm totally for them. But this is a case where I'm these two." 
or these three are on my last nerve because they're doing this wrong. And they should know better than that. Somebody should have said, hey, man, if anybody looked at it, look, you, you need to go back and look at this again. That's why it's so important to have somebody watching what you're doing, watching what's happening. It's like, hang on a second, man. You need to go ask this, this, and this, because this something's not right about that here. I've talked about that on here before, having someone observe what you're doing. I think that's really important. This has all the hallmarks of a false confession. This kid doesn't know what happened. He's he's assuming things happened because of some dream he had, and this guy is just pumping him full of answers to give. So he, he never adds anything to it. He never adds any new information. It's all given to him by by this detective. So, uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, and I agree with everybody here. And this is all happening on Halloween. So why do crimes happen more often on Halloween? We have a stacking of a few things. There's the anonymity of costumes. There's crowd behavior, increased alcohol consumption, increased deviant behavior, large numbers of people wearing costumes, even if a criminal isn't wearing one can influence criminal behavior at this point uh mark where you're talking about him finding uh his dad found a wallet totally agree he's rolling his sleeves up which i would personally uh, classify as ventilation behavior there's facial blocking facial touching there's mouth covering a lot of crazy stuff going on here and these are my notes uh the bullet notes i wrote this morning before i saw the other videos I didn't know who he was. I don't know anything about the case. He's bringing up memory loss. No mention of specific names. No mention of innocence or guilt. Trouble identifying a firm belief about the alleged perpetrator. The whole video, his posture is locked down. He's rigid. He has trouble with details and can't seem to be certain about a damn thing here. So even his statements about hitting someone start with, I think. All of those do that. So when the detective stands to exit, one thing that I thought was uh, interesting that I think you should pay attention to is the kid locks onto the detective's notepad and gets even more rigid and stiff, like staring at that notepad. That's something I look for in people who are worried, not people who are guilty, but people who are worried. I always want to see if they lock onto the data that I bring into the room. If they're worried about data or potential evidence, that is a semi-red flag to me. Let's call it a uh, let's call it a salmon flag. One of those tape replays. Yeah, you said. I'd always want to kill someone before I was 60 anyway. What night was this that this that this happened out here at the Tribune? Was there a special occasion? It was Halloween, yeah. Halloween, okay. So that night, when you see Ryan choking out, do you think that Ryan was choking to make sure he was dead? Yeah. Yeah, did he say that, or is that just you thinking that? That's what I think. Okay, all right. Was there anything taken from the guy that we will know where it's at or we'll be able to find? I think his dad found the wallet. Ryan's dad found the wallet? Yeah, but I don't know. Okay. Not for certain on that? No. Okay. And what did you say earlier about what you thought he choked him with? Or it's possible that he may have choked him with something, is that right? Yeah. But you don't know what it was? No. Okay. All right. There was obviously a lot of injuries to this guy, so it was, uh, it's pretty obvious that he was hit more than once, but you're not sure who did that, right? Yeah. So you, basically your feeling, or what you're recalling... I think I just blacked out. Okay. After you hit the guy and he went down, you see Ryan choking him? I mean, yeah. I mean, I blacked out in between when I hit the guy... And and when I see this lady, basically. Okay, but you did see Ryan choke him out. Yeah. Okay. All right. I handle this for just a second. I'm gonna try to find this Dallas guy. I'll be right back with you. Uh, now you said earlier that that after you hit after you hit the guy that you got sick. Did you actually throw up, or did you just feel you know do the right? Threw up. You did throw up. Yeah. Okay. We didn't find any vomit down there, so can you kind of point, pinpoint where you think you got sick at? Um, was it in the park, maybe, or on, on some dirt, or was it on concrete? Do you remember hearing that splashing sound? Yeah, I think. You think? Yeah. Not certain, though, right? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Back to the ranch. These are just my notes, so I don't remember asking. 
you said it was like, kind of like a tire tool style wrench, is that right? Yeah. It wasn't like a crest wrench or... I mean, independently. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Going back to when you said that, that, that you hit this guy with, with, the, with, the, with the tool, said you, got, you kind of got sick after that. Um, how many times did you think you hit him all together? Just the once. Just the once? Well, the only, problem, the only problem I have with that is I know that he was hit more than once yeah. with the tool. Because I'm saying like was, I just hit him once. You just hit him once? You didn't hit him more than no. like because 10 I, times? I just need to remember the first time that I hit him, I, like I... I just I remember hearing this noise and it just and just seeing his face and it just made me sick. And the noise was him screaming. No, it was like a groan. Okay, all right, okay. You said earlier though that it was possible that you may have hit him more than once. Is that different? Is that different? Now? No, I didn't hit him more than once. Okay, all right. What kind of shoes was you wearing that night? I don't know. All right, I'll go first on this one. Uh, when the the uh, detective asks about the vomit because he didn't find any, there's your red flag. There's your red. Why isn't there? Any, if you threw up, dude, where is it? You know, let's talk about that. Let's go into deeper. Let's start finding little things and start opening those things up and see what's going on there. He didn't care. One of two things is happening. He didn't care if if Chuck was innocent or number two, he's just uneducated about what he's doing. It, uh, he's probably done this before and it probably worked great. I mean, it was, he, he's probably had he's very a lot of success with with his approach to this, but and but when it counts, it's not it's not working. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. When you go into these, you have to go in thinking this person. Let let's find out what's happened. I can't assume they did it. You can act like they did it and act like you think they did, but you can't think that this guy's doing it wrong. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so my approach in any interrogation is to figure out what the person knows or what the person says, and then to figure out whether that implicates them somewhere else. Not to take a list and to figure out how I can get them onto that list of issues. This is almost as if he came in and said, I got all the evidence, here it is. I'm going to poke until I find out how it ties, how it ties together. And look, I, I think either way has value, as long as you're keenly aware that you need to disprove yourself along the way. If, for example, I'm talking and I go along and I, I give you a piece of information and he could be giving false information, we don't know, and the guy confirms it, then I know that he didn't do it. I've used that technique many times. The guy was hit once in the head and the guy goes, no, it was five times. Okay, I got the right guy. Or if I said the guy was hit 50 times, he said, nope, just once, then he would be confirming or denying real information. What isn't the way you should do it is just to run down a checklist of getting the guy covered. Now, I, I also think... When you're under pressure to close a case that's two years old, there's all kinds of things that happen. And if it looks like it is real, then you're probably going to run down that list. But guys, if you're if you're just running down a checklist and you're going, he did one non-pertinent question about two years ago in vomit. Well, it's not pertinent because if they didn't find it then, they can't go to the place it is now. So it has no value whatsoever in the conversation. Uh, he feeds some information about the wrench. Hit more than once. The only problem I have with that is, when he says the only problem I have with that is, he's telling him more information that he shouldn't have said. I, I, I'm, I'm just going to beat a dead horse. But this is where just knowing read fails. You can't just go learn read and not learn how to question, how to validate information, how to read a, a, the room, how to read the person you're talking to. If you just run this pressurized checklist that Reed does, assuming the person is guilty, you're going to get a lot of red flags because of the stress you're generating, because of the pressure you're generating. It's going to feed you to take that next step. You can't understand how to clear someone or to prove someone is guilty, then you're going to do this. I think what they're after here is something else. I don't see him as trying to get this guy to admit that all the details I think he's also after trying to lock down the other kid at the same time. So he's trying to verify information that this guy is giving him that he'll be able to use against the other kid. Because this guy's already pretty compliant. He's answering any question, just simply saying, I don't know. I was blacked out on cocaine and and, and beer or cocaine and alcohol. So I, I don't see the, the pressure. Martin, what do you got? 
Yeah, I agree with everything said so far. I'm going to add to all of that and say I suspect that this, uh, the interviewer here, is not at all confident in what they're doing. Uh, they don't seem to me to be professionally focused in any way. They don't seem to be professionally concentrated on what's happening. We see the guy swinging his legs on the chair. He's leaning back. He's swinging his legs. Now, look, it could be he's, you know, maybe he's doing that because he's super confident in his technique. He's super confident that he's backed up uh, with a lot of evidence. And he thinks to himself, you know, I can just sit back here and swing my legs. And that's all I need to do in this situation. And, and the person will rightfully confess. Well, no, what happens is, is the interviewer is doing all the talking. The subject is just getting to agree with with elements of it, while the interviewer swings their legs, keeps a lot of distance, doesn't even look a great deal at the interviewer. It's not the kind of professional, it's, it's not the kind of behaviours that I see with other interviewers who are more better trained or more professional about it. I'm not saying the person hasn't been trained. Uh, I'm just suggesting that probably a little bit of knowledge can be a bad thing. A little bit of success can be a bad thing. A stopped clock is is usually correct twice a day. Uh, if you put that... <laughs> You put that stop clock in a situation where it's doing world time. I mean, it's going to be right a lot of the day, but by the context of what it's trying to do. Um, and so that's why, look, you know, if you if if you hang out in a certain part part of town um, and you and you stop people and ask them to open their, you know, the boot of their car, the the the, the back of their car, a lot of the time you'll get some dodgy stuff in the back of there because you've chosen the right place in order to say, I'm going to take a look in, in, in the back. Uh, if you're going fishing, uh, the sea is often a very good place to go um, and the sea full of fish. So it, it seems to me this person may well have been fishing in a sea full of fish for, for a lot of the career. And then and so the problem is now and again, you get somebody who's innocent and then you start applying everything that you've done with this context of I'm I'm always right more than I'm wrong because of where I go fishing. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Matt, I agree with you all. And keep in mind, read as an interrogation technique gets a lot of flack because back in the 70s, here's exactly what happened. In the read books, um, they would say like someone avoiding eye contact might be being deceptive. And they had a long list in these old training manuals of this science that was available at that time. Uh, for the record, any interrogation system, any one that you can think of can be misused in the right hands. Someone can abuse and misuse any interrogation system to get a false confession. All it takes is a lot of cognitive bias, which we don't have a lot of time to get into. But the interviewer here is helping him to develop his own story with leading questions to support his own narrative. Like, you're not certain about that, right? And then uh, he says, I hit him once. And then he says, the first time that I hit him, I remember hearing this noise. So there's a distinction here between showing and telling. When we're recounting a story, uh, this is very critical. Showing involves detailed sensory descriptions of events that are kind of conveying an experience, while telling is more direct recounting that just tends to lack a lot of sensory depth. So when people rehearse a story, they more frequently use words like remember, heard, noticed, saw, which can put some distance between them and the event. So this isn't deceptive on its own, but it needs to be picked up on, especially if they don't normally speak that way. And we saw this behavior in the Amber Heard case. I even made a video compilation of it on Twitter. So the officer is helping him with the story instead of getting details. He's helping him with the narrative instead of obtaining details and truth. Every detail he wants to include in the narrative, he's not only helping the suspect with, he's rephrasing it for him so that there's a clear story. This is bad. 
The kid's seriously uncomfortable, same behavior in this clip, non-verbally, that we saw in the last clip. One of those tape replays. Uh, now, you said earlier that, that after you hit, after you hit the guy, that you got sick. Did you actually throw up, or did you just feel, you know, you did throw up? You did throw up? Yeah. Okay. We didn't find any vomit down there, so can you kind of point, pinpoint where you think you got sick at? Um, was it in the park, maybe, or on, on some dirt, or was it on concrete? Do you remember hearing that splashing sound? Yeah, I think. You think? Yeah. Not certain, though, right? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Back to the ranch. These are just my notes, so I don't remember asking. You said it was like, kind of like a tire tool style ranch, is that right? Yeah. It wasn't like a crest rancher. Okay. Okay. Mm. Going back to when you said that, that, that you hit this guy with, with the with the, with the tool, said you got you kind of got sick after that. Um, how many times did you think you hit him all together? Just like once. Just once. Well, the only problem the only problem I had with that is I know that he was hit more than once. Yeah. With, with the tool. Because I'm saying like was, I just hit him once. You just hit him once. You didn't hit him more than no. Like because I distinctly remember the first time that I hit him. I like I. I just I remember hearing this noise and it just and just seeing his face and it just made me sick. And the noise was him screaming. No, it was like a groan. Okay, all right. Okay. You said earlier though that it was possible that you may have hit him more than once. Is that di is that different? Than no, I didn't hit him more than once. Okay, all right. What kind of shoes was you wearing that night? I don't know. This is what bothers me. Okay. Let's go back to. The when you were talking about how you saw Ryan strangle this guy. Now, we know what the guy got strangled with. That's kind of the thing I've been holding back from you, uh -huh. all right? Is it possible that you know what he was strangled with and just didn't want to tell me? Because I, I know I don't know, like I think it was a shirt or something. Or okay, well, I know it wasn't a shirt. It was like uh, maybe a bungee cord or I don't, something from his car. I don't okay. see why he'd have a rope in his car. Well, we know for a fact that his belt was ripped off of his pants and he was strangled with his belt. Really? Yeah. Do you see a belt in Ryan's hand? Something look like a rope maybe or a bungee cord? I don't know. Okay. You didn't put anything in your hand though? No. Okay. I mean, I don't remember that at all. Okay. Um, something else that, that I need to ask you about. We felt like, you know, I asked you earlier if, if you had gotten hit by this guy or anything like this, but you said he kicked you in the balls when you guys I, attacked him. It's not a matter of flipping out and I don't know what's going on. We know you know what's going on. Maybe you forgot some of it, but you didn't forget all that you're telling me. Number one, I just went and looked at this guy's crime scene photographs, for, hopefully for the last time until I ever have to look at him again. Multiple, multiple, multiple contusions, hits, and strikes in this guy's head. There is no way in hell that you hit this guy once, turn around, got sick. If you only hit him once, turn away, and got sick, you had to hand the thing off to Ryan because this guy's got head wounds all over his head. We're talking minimum 15 strikes. I must have done it though. I mean, I don't know okay. that or I stopped and he did. I don't know. Did you All right, Greg, what do you got? This is a really, really, really good marriage of a poor read technique and a poorly performing perpetrator. This is not a perpetrator, but it doesn't matter. The point is, if tomorrow Chase was grabbed and brought in for this, Chase would go, didn't do it, leave me alone. Ryan, the first kid, responded the right way. This kid's uncertain because of a drug blackout. So he's going to have signs of guilt because he has a guilty conscience. Whether he did it or not, he has a guilty conscience. You hear him say, I have a guilty conscience. So what does this guy does? He pressures him. And he does that pressure and insert information again. He likely has an evidence list. Hey, here's the things that happened. And he might not have worked the case two years ago, but he's running down that list and trying to pigeonhole this guy into that list through a, a series of tools. And he's using read. And so Chase, you hit it dead on. I, with Sharfian interrogation techniques, can get a false confession in three days easily, easily. Whether I would or not is a different story. There's no value in a false confession. You're after facts. You're after getting things. I love the fact this guy doesn't just not agree with him that it was a bungee cord or shirt. He injects and he says, the only thing I've been holding back. Well, yeah, that's the only thing. How about holding back a few others? But 
he says it was a belt. And then he even uses the guy's language to convince him that what he saw might have looked like this, but it was a belt. Wow. That's a step and a stretch. When you're closing and you know the guy hasn't, and Scott, I think we were talking about it off the thing here. What they have done is go in with closed, no investigation. This is not an investigative interrogation in any way. It's just closed. This guy's guilty and I'm going to get a confession out of it. Very big mindset, very big difference. Now, did we see 15 hours of interrogation they might have done? No. So I want to make sure we point that out. We're looking at this video. Still doesn't matter because you're still feeding him information. My notes say, how about letting this guy talk? Yeah. When you're interrogating, it's usually a one to two relationship. I ask a question, you talk twice as long. That's what I want. I don't want to talk twice as long to hear yes or no. The reason we don't want leading questions, can, are, have, will, anything that results in a yes or no answer means I'm doing all the talking. I'm doing nine words, you're doing one. That doesn't make any sense when you're trying to get facts. So one of the things that we do. Um, anyway, um, I, I think I'm not even sure it's intentional. I think it just doesn't know how read really works. And Chase, you're dead on. It's any system. Scott, you're, I know because you use read, you feel like it's, you know, a damning of, of read. It's a damning of poor interrogation skill, meeting a guy mm -hmm. who doesn't, ha he, he has guilty conscience, even if he didn't do it. Now, could he have done it and blacked out? And sure, he could have, but don't know that's it. Chase, what do you got? Yeah. And I also think suggestibility plays a major role here. And suggestibility might be the reason that he, walked into the police station. Suggestibility could be why he said to his friends, that might have been me. Uh, so suggestibility also plays a huge role in false confessions. There's a, a long list. There's 17 things that are known to produce false confessions. Suggestibility is a huge one. We have fantasy proneness. Someone even being in a glucose deficit is how they refer to it in the in the literature can can do that. But he says, let's go back to where we're talking about how you saw Ryan strangle this guy. Just based on the behavior I've seen with this interviewer, I'm willing to bet whatever they discussed about the strangling was not that clear cut. So this interviewer is very skilled at revising people's words and statements. And I'm guessing this is not the first time that he's done this. So this is the most probably i think the most manipulative police interview i've seen in a very long time uh and i don't want people to get their opinion of police from this video this is very nope. rare uh maybe there was a training deficit maybe he made a mistake and maybe that mistake worked a couple of times and he kept doing it he tells him they're withholding the weapon he asks him what he remembers he corrects him and helps him to keep guessing the kid still can't remember and guesses a bungee cord, the detective then tells him what the weapon is. He doesn't withhold it anymore and ask a soft, presumptive maybe question about seeing the belt, just so he can stick it in this kid's mouth, I think, in my opinion. And the detective even adds in what the kid guessed about the crime in the mix, asking if it might have been a bungee cord. So the suggestibility is being played on here, and I don't... Honest to God, I don't believe that this detective was acting with malice. I don't think there was malice here. I don't think that there. he's had this long, probably 50 hours of training on how false confessions can be occurring and how to avoid it. Once the detective hears, I must have done it then, you can see and hear the relief in his voice. And I don't think there's a pursuit of truth just a pursuit of confession here, which is a big difference. And, you know, there's not a lot of clarification stuff. Well, tell me a little bit more about that. Well, how did you get there? How did that happen? What did it look like? What were their positions in? Just wants those couple of things in there, which is not uh, not healthy. Uh, Scott, what do you got? I agree, agree with you. It's not malice. It's ignorance. He's doing it wrong. So uh, That's why I think that He's been, these guys have been trained a long time ago, and then they're just not focusing on what they're doing. They're not remembering, not going back and 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 going. To, you can you can take the read technique a couple of times if you want to, as many times as you want to. Go back every few years and make sure everything's good. You're dealing with people's lives, so and not all police officers do that at all. Not all detectives do that. This is rare, so don't think I'm bad mouthing. Uh, police, because I'm not at all. I love them. I think they're awesome. But these guys get on my last nerve. This kid's just listening and agreeing. The detective is literally spooning 
spoon feeding him things to say and and he's just agreeing with it and then he tells him he must have have what he must have done is his hand he said you had to, to hand the thing off to ryan that tire tool and chuck says i must have done it then no if that happens you go back and start asking questions about that there's so many spots this guy can go in and say and, and, and start digging into what happened. These little these little spots you can just open wide, just stop everything there and go into those and talk about what happened in that in that instance. Where was he? Where did he come from? How far away was he? Did he walk to you? Did you walk to him? That even. But he wouldn't be able to do it. And that, that's why I think it's ignorance on this guy's part. He doesn't understand how to do this this right. Chuck is nothing much has changed body language wise. He's still open. He's listening. And he's he's agreeing. There's no pushback at all with this guy, none whatsoever. His voice, tone, and cadence don't change. His volume doesn't change. He's just as he's he's just as ignorant about what happened as this detective is. So they're they're basically in the same spot there. Neither one of them know what really happened. And the detective, every time he scores or every time he does something that that he feels like is good, or maybe in, in a couple of cases where it's frustrating, he takes his hat off or goofs around with his hat. So, there's, you know, it, we get a lot from him. We can tell what this guy's thinking. He's not I, I'm, I'm not the type to lean back in a chair and, and, and start talking to somebody about something they might have done to find out if they did it or not. And that's pretty dang relaxed looking to be talking about what he's talking about. That's and for me, I think it's a little bit disrespectful for the situation. But that, but that, but that's me. So when you interrogate somebody that agrees with you on almost everything you say, that's a huge red flag. That can't, you know, he doesn't know what's happened. He's assuming he knows what happened. You can't do that. You can't go forward when somebody just keeps agreeing with everything. I mean. She, I, I don't know how long this interrogation took or this interview took, but it can't be that long. What do y'all think? An hour, two hours? No like idea, because this is just what we found. You know, we don't right. know. I'm, like you said earlier, it could be dang 15 hours. Who knows? But with the way this this guy's talking, I don't think it could have been too long. There's there's nothing there's nothing else to go into since he's not asking these questions. And since I don't think he knows how to. But when somebody starts agreeing with everything, come back to those things later and approach them from a different direction and ask them the same question in a different way so it looks like it didn't happen or it looks like something else may have happened and see if they agree with that. How simple is that to do? It's easy. And he's not doing that either, or not that we're aware of. Obviously, he didn't because the kid went to, to prison for whatever how long he went to prison for. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, look, there, there's a lot that we're not, obviously not seeing here, um, you know, quite quite obviously. So we don't have all the information. I don't have all the information. So, so you know, what can I say for sure? Well, I know a clown when I see a clown. And this guy is a bit of a clown, quite honestly. I know there are, I know a lot of officers. I got friends who are in the police force. I think they would be very happy for me to go, this guy is a complete clown. There he is, leaning back. Legs are swinging out there. The hat's on. The hat's off. Just as you say, Scott. I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't. It suggests to me. Look, there's somebody who's had some training, and and they feel confident about it, and they're applying themselves confidently. Sure, they've got it wrong, but they're applying themselves confidently. And and if they felt any unconfidence, they might go. You know what? I'm not sure about this. I'm going to break this interview right now. I'm going to have a chat to some people. I'm gonna. I'm gonna because I'm not feeling. I don't feel right. This summing up this guy i think he knows this isn't right I, and and i don't i'm i'm su i'm not suggesting there's malice there i think there is a sense of his that he that he understands his own ineptitude because that's what we've got we got the child swinging their legs there he understands his own naivety in this situation but what he doesn't do is go i'm going to break this i'm going to go out i'm going to have a talk to myself or somebody else about this and then go back in he keeps on going so You've got some very strong, confident, not questioning. He's just throwing ideas at this guy, sitting back, swinging his legs, taking his hat off, putting it back on again, throwing ideas at this guy. Because why not? Why not throw some mud at a wall and see whether it sticks? And it's sticking. 
because because the guys the guys going well I mean he's going I don't know I don't I don't remember it's a world of possibility and we have somebody here just as you say Chase who is very open to that possibility very open to going I, I don't know and and it's I'm I'm only picking this up now because I don't know anything about this case but I'm picking up that he he had a dream he had a dream that he that he um was part of the crime. Well, I mean, how how much more suggestible could you get when you, you every, everybody's woken up out of dreams and gone, wow, that was that was a bit real. That was a bit odd. That was a bit real. And you can't quite tell the difference for a bit, you know, of what's true and what isn't true. And, you know, the part of your brain that does, the, the visualizes during dreams, it's the same part of your brain that visualizes the actual world around you. So, so you can have a dream where really the brain doesn't really know the difference. Uh, the only difference it can tell is going, well, that was a bit bizarre. I know that didn't happen. But some dreams that you have, you're like, yeah, it's a possibility. It's, it, it looked very real to me. It's within the scope of something I might do. I mean, that that might have that might have happened. Well, so very suggestible state there. If he's if he's dreamt this up, I, I'm, there could be some some strong reality to it as well. But this is not a situation that's liable to get to that reality to get the truth out of it. Uh yeah, yeah. The only he reminds me, you know, when where they, they just had the um, the Christmas um, uh, Santa Claus parade. You know, and the police are always uh, involved in the Christmas Santa Santa Claus parade here, so it's always great to see them come out. I would expect him to be part of the parade, and he would have one of those wigs on. You know, the multicolored wigs on, and the big the big feet. Complete clown. I don't mind saying it. One of those tape replays. Okay. Let's go back to when you were talking about how you saw Ryan strangle this guy. Now. We know what the guy got strangled with. That's kind of the thing I've been holding back from you. Uh -huh. All right. Is it possible that you know what he was strangled with and just didn't want to tell me? Because I, I know. I don't know. Like, I think it was a shirt or something. Or okay, well, I know it wasn't a shirt. It was like, uh, maybe a bungee cord or I don't something from his car. I don't see why he'd have a rope in his car. Well, we know for a fact that his belt was ripped off of his pants and he was strangled with his belt. Really? Yeah. Do you see a belt in Ryan's hand? Something look like a rope, maybe, or a bungee cord? I don't know. Okay. You didn't put anything in your hand, though? No. Nah. Okay. I mean, I don't remember that at all. Okay. Um, something else that, that I need to ask you about. We felt like, you know, I asked you earlier if, if you had gotten hit by this guy or anything like this, but you said he kicked you in the balls when you guys I, attacked him. It's not a matter of flipping out and I don't know what's going on. We know you know what's going on. Maybe you forgot some of it, but you didn't forget all that you're telling me. Number one, I just went and looked at this guy's crime scene photographs, for, hopefully for the last time until I ever have to look at him again. Multiple, multiple, multiple contusions, hits, and strikes in this guy's head. There is no way in hell that you hit this guy once, turn around, got sick. If you only hit him once, turn around, and got sick, you had to hand the thing off to Ryan because this guy's got head wounds all over his head. We're talking minimum 15 strikes. I must have done it, though. I mean, I don't know okay. if that or I stopped and he did. I don't know. Did this is what bothers me. Did you ever drop the pipe? Probably. Did you hand it off to Ryan? I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. So when you say that you must have flipped out, then maybe you flipped out and hit this guy more than once. Yeah. Because there's no way that this guy got hit with once. And I'm not, I'm not barking at you. I'm just telling you the truth because I saw I a picture of that. It's just I don't... I don't you get the car stuff I know. Stuff. I mean, I know. I mean, I, that's okay. fine. And I, I know, and I told you that. Already. Okay. I understand. But I'm just reminding you where we were at. Yeah. I, I don't... Because what's going to happen, eventually, I'm sure the crime stop will come forward now that they know that all this is coming to a head. That's fine. And I, I got to impress this upon you one more time. And, and this is the last time I'm going to tell you this, Chuck, okay? Yeah, I know. Ryan's going to talk. Don't let Ryan tell a story for you. I don't know what else to do because I can't. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if he's gonna put it on me. Like, I, I don't really probably. Care. I don't care. Okay. I mean, I must. Have you just... you know you're involved and you're ready to take that hit, basically. Yes. Okay. All right. 
You want to leave that? So you want me to light that for you before I go? Or I've got a lighter. In your pocket? Yeah. Well, don't be burning nothing in the wall, man. No, I'm not going to. Here, why don't you give me your lighter? I'm not, you're not supposed to hand it up here. Oh, no, actually, I don't. Okay, I didn't think so. I have a okay. No, Chase, what do you got? So there's not a lot wrong technically here in this video. He's not really directing him how you know to answer the questions. He's using a very common statement of don't let X, Y, Z tell the story for you. That's a common thing. But the one thing we aren't seeing here is the search for truth. The questions are closed ended, uh, which when you're asking somebody about an evening two years ago, as I understand this was, it yep. can be very difficult to obtain some kind of truth with a lot of closed-ended questions. So it seems like the detective is after a confession of possibility, a confession of possibility. Uh, so Mark talks about this all the time, possibility versus probability with that uh, thought experiment there. And is it possible you did this? And then it feels good enough for him to move to the next question. Is it possible you did this? And he kind of just lets that hang. And in this instance, I think it's, it seems there are some parts he might genuinely have trouble remembering. I think that's genuine. And there's something called a behavioral interview that might be beneficial here in a situation like that where they use different uh, techniques and questioning to ascertain a lot more details about stuff like that. Very common in traumatic, more traumatic situations to help somebody recall an event or a detail. Uh, they even use uh, hypnosis in some of these cases, which can't be, you can't elicit a confession, but you can elicit details to help you obtain evidence with hypnosis. And there's, you know, varies by state, but that's all I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. I think the interviewer here now is getting very insecure about the way that this is this is going. The hat comes off his head. He goes into what I would call third circle and he, he locks all his joints and puts his hat back on. That's extreme for this situation. Why have we got this interviewer who should be professional, calm, engaged? Uh, I mean, he could be trying to play the part of somebody insecure and moving towards getting extremely agitated. And we'll see where he goes uh, in a few videos time. But already for me, he's ramping up in his in not being able to control his own energy here, which suggests if he's in a professional situation, he's probably not following a sense of procedure for himself where he can feel grounded. He can feel like he knows where this is going. It may not be moving where he wants it to go fast enough, or he may not feel that he is in control of the procedure and therefore it's going to run away from him just like his hat seems to escape him and then go back on. Also an example, Chase, I think of extreme venting going on there where you're, you know, releasing the heat from your head. Uh, if he was calm and assertive in this situation, I don't think he'd be doing that. So he's probably at the opposite end of calm and assertive right now, which is not where you want somebody who has potentially, you know, 10, 15, 20 years of your life in their hands at this moment. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree with you. I think he's probably excited right now because he thinks, I got this one. We're going to wrap this up. Look what I've done. Look what's going on. That, that's what I think is happening. And he says, maybe you flipped out and hit this guy more than once. And then Chuck agrees with him. He's feeding them, him the scenario piece by piece. He's feeding him the answers he wants to hear. And he never says, and he could have here too, tell me what happened. Because he already said, I don't remember what happened. But he doesn't go back and, and like I said, come from a different angle and say, let's go through what happened the, the, the last hour before you were there, or the last two hours before you showed up there. Where were you at that point? Never does that. In the last interaction, uh, the detective's cadence goes through the roof. And he does that as he's, he's, he's dropping that idea of Ryan making a deal to screw Chuck over. So it's placed in his mind real solid. So he gets that. And that's it. You know, that that's what there's nothing wrong with that. Making them think somebody's going to gonna is already talking or is going to talk to give them that idea to get them to talk. Nothing wrong with that. That's a that's something you'll do that. That's quite common. Nothing wrong with it. But that's what he's, he's doing there. And, and for the other stuff, it's so obvious that nobody 
was was observing what was happening. And if they did, I wouldn't be saying I did at this point because they would have seen that and gone, dude, wait just a minute. Hang on a minute. You get let's this isn't right. Something's not wrong. Somebody would have said to somebody up higher, they would have left the room and said, he's doing this wrong. This kid, well, I'm I'm gonna get too deep into the I, I love the police. I just think these guys are are doing it wrong. Greg, what do you got? So let's talk for just a minute about interrogation. First of all, I want to go back to something you said last time. When a guy is always agreeing with you, the approach you take is, okay, I've said enough. Why don't we just tell me what you do remember? Just stop. Mm -hmm. Let him talk. And where he says, I don't remember, okay, then you might poke and prod a little bit, but you let him talk. That way you know you're not feeding them. And most of the time when a person is feeding someone information under duress, this guy didn't wake up in the morning looking over his Cheerios and say, I'm going to put this kid in jail for the rest of his life. I don't care if he did it. That's not how it works most of the time. It's simply ineptitude at understanding human psyche, how things work and how people get under duress. That's number one. Number two, my world interrogation. I know more about you than you know about you most of the time. Once I get to the point, I'm ready to go to close something because we've got situation maps. Once I determine who you are, <clears throat> let's take a war. A war is a beautiful thing from an interrogation point of view because we have a situation map. I walk in, I look at that, assuming I'm in a cage, and I know everything that happened around the place you were captured for the past 48 hours. So I know how you ended up where you were when you were captured. When I'm trying to get you to talk. I'm not going to tell you what I know. I'm going to talk to you, ask you questions until you do something that tells me where you were exactly on that map. So then I can try to tie you to a to a situation. Lots of Middle Eastern wars. There's not it's not all above board army against army. There's a lot of other things going on behind the scenes. And often you'll have guys committing IEDs, doing all that kind of stuff, planting IEDs. So those kind of people are not wearing uniforms and they're not captured that way. What we do is we have to have all that information in our head, and we're asking you questions, not to link you to it, but to see where you were and how you were tied in. Chase, I'm sure in your time, when if you did a lot of ground operation, I know the Navy did a fair amount of ground operation in Afghanistan, for example, then we sweep and we bring in a lot of people, and we're trying to find the person. And you have to be careful not to tell them what you know and to feed them. What we're not seeing is that here. If you really want to know, Pay attention to this entire video that's about to come up next, and we're replaying it, and watch what happens when the guy is asked any open-ended question. How does he answer? I don't remember. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. When he's asked any question that's not open-ended, yes or no, leading questions, he goes yes or no. That's it. He doesn't say, I'm not sure. So he's looking for guidance. He's looking, Chase, you talked about it earlier. This guy's 19 years old, probably, maybe 18, don't know maybe 20, because it was two years after they were in high school, my understanding. There's deference to power in those cases, and you're in captivity. And we all know that people defer to their capture until they get to be part of that system, and they are well-versed in that system. Then they, they'll flip you off in an interrogation room in a minute. But when they're brand new to the system, first time they've been in any kind of trouble, they're more deferential to power than usual. Listen to those two things. No open-ended answers. And yeses and noes every time there's a projected question. One of those tape replays. Did you ever drop the pipe? Probably. Did you hand it off to Ryan? I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. So when you say that you must have flipped out, then maybe you flipped out and hit this guy more than once. Yeah. Because there's no way that this guy got hit with once. And I'm not, I'm not barking at you. I'm just telling you the truth because I saw I'm a picture of it. Says, I don't, I don't. You get the crime stuff I know. I mean, I know. I mean, I, that's okay. fine. And I, I know, and I told you that. Already. Okay. I understand, but I'm just reminding you where we were at. Yeah. I, I don't... Because what's going to happen eventually, I'm sure the crime stop will come forward now that they know that all this is coming to a head. That's fine. And I, I got to impress this upon you one more time. And, and this is the last time I'm going to tell you this, Jeff, okay? Yeah, I know. Ryan's going to talk. Don't let Ryan tell a story for you. I don't know what else to do because I can't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if he's going to put it on me. Like, I, I don't really Probably. Care. I don't care. Okay. I mean, I must have you, just... You know you're involved and you're ready to take that hit, basically. Yes. Okay. All right. You want to leave that, you want me to light that for you before I go, or? I've got a lighter. In your pocket? Yeah. Well, don't be burning nothing in the wall. Then. No, I'm not going to. Here, why don't you give me your lighter? I'm not, you're not supposed to hand it up here. Oh, no, actually, I don't. Okay, I didn't think so. I, I'm this is what bothers me. Um, 
I wanted to start off by, by just telling you a little bit about what, uh, what I've learned, and, and that is that, um, you know, the officers, has, they've gone to Kansas City, and, and they've gotten in touch with Ryan, and to make a long story short, Ryan is saying, I don't know anything, wasn't there, uh, I don't know what Chuck's talking about, he's crazy. Uh, if he, you know, if it happened, if it went down the way he said, he obviously he did it himself. Um, and pretty much, that's what's happened. Now, I mean, I'm, I, I, I don't know. I, I think Detective Short probably explained to you earlier when you visited with him that, you know, pretty much Ryan's story could. could come out in any form or fashion. Uh, I don't know specifically what he told you, yeah. but you know, Ryan could say anything from that was his entire idea uh, to I wasn't there, I have no idea what he's talking about, man, the guy must be flipped out, you know, um, <clears throat> to, well, hey, I was there, but you know, uh, I didn't know we were going to do anything like that, and, and first thing I know, Chuck's over there beating up on some guy. So you never know what kind of, what, what form uh, their story is going to take. And uh, certainly from what you explained to us, it's, it's bottom line not true. Now, with that, here comes the importance of our conversation. And that is to go back from the very beginning to the point that that uh, it was even merely suggested that you guys leave. I don't know. I mean, like, I don't even, it's just so foggy. Like, I could just be sitting here fabricating all of it and not know. Like, I don't know. I don't. All right, Chase, what do you got? Uh, you'll have to wait till the end of this clip to see this, but here's what I want you to pay attention to. The interviewer here sets the stage to build anxiety. This is very common in the situations where a plea deal is about to go on the table or somebody's not being straightforward. So as he sets the stage, he does some textbook maneuvers. He levels down with the suspects. He puts his papers aside so it's not a barrier in between him and the suspect. He does the leaning in. He lowers his tone, placing elbow on the table, place the other hand downward so he's perfectly imperfectly mirroring the suspect so he's changed his body language to mirror the suspect which is kind of a textbook way to kind of set up this uh build up for what's going to come next in the next video scott all right uh chuck's body language hasn't changed in a bit he rubs his head a couple of times as we do when we're frustrated confused or stressed his chest and legs and arms are are fairly open i mean they're wide open really this isn't that fake uh, I'm open and listening body language that we saw with Grant Harden a couple of episodes ago where the guy's sitting there with his hands on his legs and he's sitting there wide well, open like that and just answering questions and say, you know, all he's doing. It's not that fake kind. This is what it looks like for real when somebody's being open and they're completely listening. I mean, it can't, you can't look any more like you're, you're engaged than this kid's looking like it uh, right now. So, and then the, this guy detective or whatever he is, um, I mean, we were discussing earlier, he may be something else because he talks like an attorney. Um, but he, he says the detective was visiting with him. He said, the, the guy you're visiting with, <laughs> which is fine to do that. That's actually pretty good. So you don't say the guy was interrogating you or the earlier, the guy you're talking to, it sounds like visiting with you. So it keeps it, you know, keeps it calm and smooth sounded. Then Chuck says he doesn't know about all this and he could just be uh, fabricating it all. That's when everything should come to a stop. And you go, do what now, dude? What'd you just say? Yeah, I could just be making all this up. And there you go, wide open, right there. You go down that road and get into all that. Doesn't do it. Not interested. Doesn't even try to do that. And I don't think it went past him. I don't think the other guys were, mm. were doing this with malice. But this guy, I, it may not be malice, maybe ignorance on this guy's part as well. But he, he's doing it wrong. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Well, if he, in fact, isn't the district attorney and not a police investigator, he wouldn't probably go to read. It's probably not part of what he would do. What he's doing is 
quite simply the logical approach. Hey, you're in trouble. Here's what we know. And now what he, what we know could be stuff that we have fed you and you fed us back. Here's the interesting piece. He treats him as if the guy is resistant. Like, <clears throat> I don't want to hear this, do that, do this. Let me show you the best indicator in the world. He's not resistant. His knees are about that far apart and they're facing right at him. Nobody does that. I mean, maybe a hardened criminal will sit there and throw him out at you as he's sitting back throwing his legs out like that. But most people under duress, and especially a guy resisting, is not going to be that wide open. His groin, the thing that people instinctively protect first, he's sitting there with it wide open. So he's not resisting. And when he says, I don't know, this could be fabricated, I'm with you. I'd say, what? what? Hold on. He's not resisting. And he says those words. I probably would say, let, let's go back and talk to the investigators. Let's get somebody else in here. Let's look at everything we got and see what's going wrong. That's all I got on this one. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, look, simple for me. Who's most assured or, you know, physically in this situation? Who's most assured verbally? For me, it's the person being interviewed, not the interviewer. The interviewer doesn't seem assured at all. Uh, Greg, you said, you know, look, we, we'll get to, you know, that this is this is a a, uh, a fact and therefore and therefore. Uh, it seems like the, the potential attorney here is trying to do um, some logic, but there is no logic to it. I, I tried to follow his pattern of thought there. I, I couldn't follow it. it. It falls down pretty quickly. In the in a statement of logic, um, you, you know, you need a point of fact, which should be, you know, be able to co be corroborated by more than two people to go, look, this is an actual fact. And therefore, logically, because of this fact, therefore, A, and because of A, therefore, B, and, and this is the situation you're in right now because of fact, which is undeniable. He has no facts. There's nothing that he states as fact at all. And therefore, his logic is going nowhere. And that's why the, the interviewee interrupts with, I don't know. And that is the most assured thing that we hear in this. The attorney, the interviewer, whoever he might be, the DA, whoever this person might be, is unassured in what they're saying. The the um, the person being interviewed is very assured in what they're saying. One of those tape replays. Um, I wanted to start off by by just telling you a little bit about what uh, what I've learned. And, and that is that, um, you know, the officers, has, they've gone to Kansas City and, and they've gotten in touch with Ryan. And to make a long story short, Ryan is saying, I don't know anything, wasn't there. Uh, I don't know what Chuck's talking about. He's crazy. Uh, if he, you know, if it happened, if it went down the way he said, he obviously he did it himself. Um, and pretty much that's what's happened. Now, I mean, I'm, I, I, I don't know. I, I think Detective Short probably explained to you earlier when you visited with him that, you know, pretty much Ryan's story could, could come out in any form or fashion. Uh, I don't know specifically what he told you. Yeah. But, you know, Ryan could say anything from that was his entire idea uh, to, I wasn't there, I have no idea what he's talking about, man, the guy must be flipped out, you know, um, <clears throat> to, well, hey, I was there, but you know, uh, I didn't know we were going to do anything like that, and, and first thing I know, Chuck's over there beating up on some guy. So you never know what kind of, what, what form uh, their story is going to take, and uh, certainly from what you explained to us, it's, it's bottom line not true. Now, with that, here comes the importance of our conversation, and that is to go back from the very beginning to the point that, that uh, it was even merely suggested that you guys leave. I don't know. I mean, like, I don't even, it's just so foggy. Like, I could just be sitting here fabricating all of it and not know. Like, I don't know. I don't. This is what bothers me. Let me go back one step further. You don't know exactly who brought it up initially. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, because I, it's just, it's, I just, 
Because now, now like Detective Short told you, Ryan, and, and I don't think you and I have even gone there, um, there's specifics about this whole thing that you provided that there was no way for anyone, including yourself, to even know. Bottom line, there would, would be no way um, if you hadn't have been involved and been uh, there. So my angle to you is I need to know as much information about what Ryan said to you that's, and what that's Ryan the, did. That's the best I can tell you. Like, I don't... Okay, well, let's start. You start. You, you were at the club, right? Yeah. yeah. And my understanding is, and I, I'm just going to try to uh, briefly explain to you uh, what, what my understanding is, is, is that uh, you guys needed money. I, this is this is all right. This is after reading the newspaper article in October, mm -hmm. and this is kind of what I put together. With I mean, I don't know if I'm just flipping out or whatever, but I mean, this is kind of what I put together with what could have happened. We I remember we were at the club, we ran out of money. Like he'd been asking his sister to borrow money, and then from there on, I'm just kind of presuming what happened. I'm making presumptions based on what I read in the newspaper. Well, you're making accurate presumptions that, like I said, that you would only know if you were there. Like what? What? The the lady? The cleaning lady? That's one. That was in the newspaper. Well, no, about what was specifically said she to that to get lady. Out? I mean... No, no, you explained... I'm not going I mean, to you understand, there. like, I wouldn't be here if mm -hmm. I didn't feel guilty about it. But it's just, I don't, I can't recollect. I and mean, it's just a trip for me to mm -hmm. have to sit here and... Try to look at something that happened that I've read about and try to base well, what I, mean, I remember. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is an interesting one because he starts walking through. He actually leaks a little information. He says, you get my angle. Hmm, angle. You don't say that in an interrogation room typically, which makes me think he chased you probably right. He's probably not an interrogator. We know to protect those words. We know to protect things. There's actually early in these videos a good example of the guy trying to avoid using the word innocent, stumbles over his own words, because we don't use those words. When we say those words, then the person automatically grips them. What he's starting to try to do is right, the logical approach, that backstory. Tell me about your backstory. And then when he runs into gaps, then you micro interview. I'm saying, hey, Chase, tell me about the evening of this. You go bam, bam, bam. And then I go, oh, hold on. Let's talk about it in then because I don't know exactly what's going on in your world. Let's talk through the mechanics of that. And then I would just open up and go after the pieces where there's vagueness or that kind of thing. That's a really easy way to do. But what you as an interrogator should not do is tell the person what you understand. What you should do is have them tell you what happened. Ask, ask, ask. There, this kid's doing more declaration of I don't know. He hasn't yet said I didn't do it. Not once. He's not said I didn't do it. He's cooperative. He's compliant. He's trying to help. And he's saying, I think I did it. This is what we're hearing from this kid. That's pretty much an admission of guilt. So why are they beating this horse and running him down the path? I think it's because they think there are two people who did it. They saw two people. The eyewitnesses saw two people. So they want to capture both of them. And there's pressure to close on who that other person is and to get him. So if you can get all the information dragged in from this one person and make the other person complicit in what happened or the trigger man, so to speak, then you can go back and drive that other person and make them give in quicker. It's back to something you said last time, Scott, it's really normal for us to use your friends against you. It, when you're in an interrogation mm -hmm. room, you should expect that because using evidence provided by another is often one of the approaches we use to get it. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, well, you know, why are they running him down this road? I think because they're probably still unassured themselves because he's unassured. The subject is unassured. He's able to go, uh, look, I, th I think I was there and I probably hit the guy once, but probably, probably. He's not there going, definitely, it's definitely me. And also, as this, uh, let's just say attorney, let's su suspect that it's an attorney, starts doing his attorney's logic, which isn't logic because there are no facts. He doesn't state one fact. So you can't have the logic without the, that, that, that opening fact. Um, the, the subject here um, calls up the presumptions. He, he says, you know, that's a, that's a presumption. So not only can he say, Hey, I, I think I hit the guy once, but also he's going, at the same time, I think your idea, your stories are full of presumptions and it's not logical. 
So it's it's it, he's able to do the two things at the same time, which the attorney here or whoever it is isn't able to do. He's running down this road of you did it, and the subject there is going yes and no at the same time, and that's tricky for him. And again, I think he's going to get frustrated. I think he's going to get frustrated, and we'll see. We'll see what happens around that. Uh, Scott, what you got on this one? He's the kid tries to talk, but he shuts him down. He does the classic thing with his hands, and that's a read technique. You know, you, when they start talking, you try to shut him down, but there's no reason for him to do that because the kid is trying to give him information. He's not being combative with his information, and he's not going, "Well, you did this, this, and this," and none of that. That's when you use. That's when you start using those. That that style of shutting somebody down, and it works like a charm uh, most of the time. But there's no reason to be doing that because, like you were saying, there's no he's not being combative with him. He's agreeing. He's like, yeah, yeah, here's what happened. Here's what happened. He's not trying to, to deflect or do anything else. So, yeah, I, I, I agree that I think this is the district attorney as well. Then Chuck lays it all out, and he tells him why and how he came up with this this line of, of reasoning and thought that he might have been part of it. He says that he saw it in the paper and he may have dreamed it or something. Like he said before, I probably I could be fabricating this and this guy doesn't stop him. And if he was aware at all of anything body language wise, hell, if he watched two of our our episodes, he go, oh, OK, I get it. This guy's not that, this, that something's not right here. Let me go. I'll be back. Let me let me go do something, I'll be back, and then go find out what he needs to do next, because obviously he wouldn't know. Uh, uh, Greg, what do you got? Did you go? That's how Piotr... Okay, Chase, you go. So this is a, a common tactic of police, especially when somebody's having difficulty with memory. And for the for this whole video, just keep in mind one theme, and that is suggestibility is fluid. Suggestibility is fluid. It's not a set factor that's like, I'm this level of suggestible. And police confirmation bias can play into all kinds of interrogations. And they're human. They're human beings just like we are. So we're not sitting here casting a lot of judgment here. We've made uh, mistakes like this, uh, especially early in our, our days. I'll just speak for myself. But if somebody's literally offering themselves up like this kid is, and I do think he's genuinely struggling with memory. It's common for police to weaponize this in some places, uh, this memory issue to their advantage. And you can do this in an ethical way sometimes. I don't know how the case, I don't know the case very well, but I'm willing to bet that he actually didn't say anything that no one else would be able to know. Just based on the other detective's behavior and potential deception i don't think there's a way he said anything without me it being covertly fed to him so i'm really quick i'm going to run down this list i'm going to give you seven ways that police can uh, manipulate memory impairment and i've studied memory impairment for 25 years Let's see if you can recognize any of these seven here number one feeding information suggesting that they have mentioned something that maybe they didn't Two, exploiting confusion, exploiting this to mix up details, creating false memories. This is a thousand times easier to do than you think it is. So suggestive questioning, you can kind of implant false memories very easy, super risky in people with memory impairments like this too. Misinterpreting forgetfulness. So the inability to remember stuff can be wrongly interpreted as uh, evasiveness and guilt. Then there's a pressure to fill gaps, hardcore pressure to fill up those gaps. And interrogators are on the line to try to get a, con a confession. And a lot of these departments put excess pressure on the interrogators, on the detectives to close the case down, which drives a lot of their behavior. Then there's manipulating trust or authority where they might just rely on their level of authority in the room which can also increase suggestibility and cause somebody to question themselves more. And finally, just overstating evidence is there. They might just falsely claim some solid evidence linking there. Maybe you saw some of those. One of those tape replays. Let me go back one step further. You don't know exactly who brought it up initially. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, because, I, it's just, it's, I just, because now, 
Now, like Detective Short told you, Ryan, and, and I don't think you and I have even gone there, um, there's specifics about this whole thing that you provided that there was no way for anyone, including yourself, to even know. Bottom line, there would, would be no way um, if you hadn't have been involved and been uh, there. So my angle to you is I need to know as much information about what Ryan said to you that's, and what that's Ryan the, did. That's the best I can tell you. Like, I don't... Okay, well, let's start. You started, you, you were at the club, right? Yeah. And my understanding is, and I, I'm just going to try to uh, briefly explain to you uh, what, what my understanding is, is, is that uh, you guys needed money. I, this is this is all right. This is after reading the newspaper article in October, mm -hmm. and this is kind of what I put together with. I mean, I don't know if I'm just flipping out or whatever, but I mean, this is kind of what I put together with what could have happened. We I remember we were at the club, we ran out of money. Like he'd been asking his sister to borrow money, and then from there on, I'm just kind of presuming what happened. I'm making presumptions based on what I read in the newspaper. Well, you're making accurate presumptions that, like I said, that you would only know if you were there. Like what? What? The the lady, the cleaning lady? That's one. That was in the newspaper. Well, no, about what was specifically said she to that to get lady. Out? I mean... No, no, you explained... I'm not going I mean, to go saying, like, I wouldn't be here if I didn't feel guilty about it. But it's just, I don't, I can't recollect. I and mean, it's just a trip for me to mm -hmm. have to sit here and... Try to look at something that happened that I've read about and try to base. Well, what I, mean, I remember. This is what bothers me. Try to base. Well, what I, mean, I remember off of that. You know, it's but, it's let's, a mind let's, fuck. Let's let's, let's just stop right here. Okay. Now, <clears throat> one thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to sit here and listen to this kind of gibberish. Okay, that's not. I'm not going to waste my time doing. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Wait. Now listen. It's my. I'm going to start talking, okay, I'm sorry. and you're going to start listening. Okay. All right, I'm going to be point blank with you, pal. Right now, your hind end is the one that's hanging over the edge, and Ryan could care less about it. Okay. Okay? Do you understand me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, you better start thinking very clearly. Okay. Because it's you that is on this chopping block. Okay. Am I clear yes. to you? Yes. Now, do we need to go by or go back and go through this step by step? No. Well, I think we do, and that's what we're going to do. And I don't want to hear, oh, all of a sudden I just think I'm going to refabricate all this. And, uh, well, I don't no. What I want to hear is exactly what Ryan told you because that's what's going to keep you in a position to where you're not going to be the sole individual out here responsible for what happened to Kent. Okay. Okay? Yeah. I can't be any more clear to you than that. I understand. And you need to understand it. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. Um, Look, now, <laughs> I love this. So he gets in close, he gets into intimate space. His hand comes into intimate distance to the face. That's 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 a pretty big move. Um, so so he, I mean, again, he looks like he's going to give him a dance. I don't know where the money exchanged hands on this one, but that's a, that's a little bit, that's a little bit close, I would say. So somebody is getting a little bit too uh, out, of, out of hand and a bit upset here. Uh, why do I think that? Well, he's he's doing whatever he's doing. Uh, I don't know what he thinks he's doing there, but he doesn't get the answer he was looking for. He says, do we need to go back step by step? No, says the, says the interviewee. And he says, well, I think we do. What he was hoping for is he's going to go, do we need to go back step by step? And he was hoping the interviewer would, would say, yes, yes, yes. Look, let's go back to the beginning. Here's what he was hoping for a yes. He doesn't get a yes. Whatever he's trying to do here is not getting him the answers that he's looking for. He shouldn't have to be getting that close to anybody to be getting 
to, to be getting this kind of bad reaction. If it was working, if what he was doing was working, he'd be getting the answers that he's looking for. He'd be getting the, the results he's looking for. He's not. He's getting agitated. He's getting upset. And it's that, that lovely bit of acting that he does. I don't want to hear any... Whoa. It's like it's like if Ricky Gervais did did a a, a take on a bad interrogation now because he's got just bad mocking acting going on in this. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right, this is where his hands are up and he's still he's trying to get Chuck to stop talking, but he's not being combative like I was saying earlier. There's no reason to do that, and he says. I don't want to hear you say, oh, I may have fabricated all this. you got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me that he said that out loud. I don't know, man. I think this guy, he he took the read technique, and he's remembering parts of it and how to do it, the stuff that he thinks will help him, but he's not remembering the intricacies of it or how to use it. The reason I like him, like Greg was talking about earlier, the reason I like three techniques is because you can use it like a muscle car. You can put the kind of, you can use those, those, that little line of, of questioning and you can do it in your own style to fit any situation or most any situation, not when you're dealing with terrorists and stuff, when you're dealing with, with normal criminals, <laughs> but you can, like, if it was a car, I was like, say you put flame paint flames on the front of it and, and big old tires or small tires with those steering wheels. That's a chain, whatever you want to put in it. You can make your car, your technique, your read technique, do whatever you need to do. You just build it for that specific situation and you can change it as it goes along. That's why I like it. But this guy's just using the, the, the stock stuff, bringing it right out, going, oh, I need, I'm going to start talking here. And there's no reason for him to do that because the kid's trying to explain what happened. Unless, and the reason I thought he was an attorney of the DA was because he doesn't want him to say anything. He's being, he's being too aggressive with him for no reason. There's no reason for him to be acting this way and doing that with him. Unless he wants to make sure he gets a confession out of him and makes him say, yeah, I did, which he said he did it but gets him to, to with beyond a shadow of a doubt that he did it on paper, not in real life. But so it looks that way. Oof. Mark or uh, Chase, what do you got? So this hands up gesture is taught in several interrogation schools. And uh, depending on which one you go to, they're going to teach you to hold them up and wait or hold them up and talk at the same time. But if you want classic read, what is it supposed to look like and sound like? It's not supposed to be confrontational like this. But here's precisely what the read technique should be looking like. It should be, Scott, hold on a second. I know that's important to you, and I promise you that we're going to get to that. But here's the, what we need to address right now. That's exactly what it should look like and sound like. So here's seven ways that this is leading down the road to a false confession. He's dismissing the suspect's perspective completely, intimidation and threat, pressuring to agree, creating a binary scenario, which is to a confession, leading towards a desired confession, uh, ignoring uh, possible recantation is what they call it. So not allowing them to do or say anything and then forcing a specific narrative. The aggressive move of the interviewer here is a hallmark of something I can't say on YouTube. I'll just say beta male. This is a sign of insecurity. It's posturing and it's artificial toughness. And he waits until Chuck is vulnerable, making him feel a little more powerful. And I think he takes advantage of this. This is my opinion here out of his own insecurity and fear that he has no control over the situation. Greg? Yeah, let me point to how you know that this is not his personality. When If I were to explode and be the bad guy, so you come in to be the good guy, doesn't affect me. I've got a great example when I was doing a show for British TV called Torture the Guantanamo Guidebook. I grabbed this kid and jacked him up because it was what we're supposed to do, one of the approaches. Scream, yell at him, bang my elbows against the wall, all this kind of stuff. And I walked out and one was like, you look really upset. I was like, no, nope, just would like a soda. Just walk out. It's acting. And Mark, to your point, some cannot act. Some people cannot act. So they are like, I know you are a terrorist. 
You know, you can hear them talking that, that way. And they just, you can't teach people to do that. You, you have people who want to be an actor who can't. They don't have the ability to change the way they think, to look at it from another's perspective, to project information. But this guy is not, the reason I'm saying that just what you just said about the kind of personality he has is clear because his fight or flight gets up when he tries to jack this guy up even a little bit. If you don't believe that, he loses verbal fluency. Boom, 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 boom. He starts to go, do we need to do this step by? Uh, 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 and he starts stammering and has to correct himself. That tells you something has changed in his head and we'll see it again. So there's that in him. The interrogation is working on him as well as the other guy. When he's saying, I'm going to talk now, why? That's all you guys have done. Why don't you shut up and let this kid talk? The kid has talked plenty and will tell you anything you want to know. But that's not what they want to hear. They want to get the information in a package that fits their driver. And to your point, Chase, if all I want is a confession, I always said this. I can get a confession from you. Look, I'm a seer guy. I can get a confession from you in three days to anything I want. Anything. I mean, you may have never been in that place and I could get it. Because absolute pressure Control of all the person's resources, reward where you want it, is the answer to that. This can all be over. This can all be over. Usually when you know a person is pushing to get you that point. Torture is the same thing. Torture is a, an uneducated person's shortcut to getting a person to feel like they have to comply. Um, this is all about getting both of these guys instead of one handful of other things. This cop is stumbling over his own words because he's feeling a duress. Um you guys have covered everything else. I'll just leave it at that. But you can see that it's even impacting. And these guys are, they may be senior guys who've interrogated a ton of people. Mark, I think you said it best. Maybe this always happened into guilty people. Maybe. And maybe they happen to people who roll over pretty easily and become guilty people. Don't know. But I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning and goes to set out to send people to jail for something they didn't do. There may be a handful of people in the world. But I do think if you don't know what you're doing and you can't see the things we're talking about here, you probably need some training. That's all I got. Yeah, finally, Greg, to your point, man, about the beta male thing. I'm not saying that I'm not trying to insult this guy, but his default to that being the solution means yeah. that he might view that in other ways. So he's kind of approaching this in a way that he's making himself look subordinate to this other person. Whoever loses composure first in the interrogation room loses the game. Yeah. And you, and you know, Chase, I've had the Brits would always say you can never go from fear up back to any, you can, you just have to be fluid in, in your approaches. And when we talk about these approaches or these tools, all these things, Scott, you talk about, you know, about read being a thing that you both, all these interrogation things have to be that fluid or they're not effective. I, I've forever would, I had students in the nineties over in Georgia, I would go down and talk to them and they had a Gumby as their mascot and their little motto was Semper Gumby forever flexible. Cause when you walk in the interrogation room, every plane that you've had falls to shit. It's just the way it is. Yeah. And I always like to say uh, interrogation is theater for one, because that's really that what you're life. doing. Yeah, I may I may have read that in one of your books, Greg. You probably did. It's my first book. Yeah. Okay, that I probably did years ago. But that that's one of the things I always open up with. It's it's theater for one because you have to go in and you have to mold yourself to whatever's happening. You know, you have to be the nice guy or hey, what's happening? Or you have to be a you know the more aggressive person, or you can slide from one to the other. It's theater for one. One of those tape replays. Started base, well, but I, mean, I remember off of that, you know, it's, but it's let's, a mind let's, fuck, you know? let's, let's just stop right here. Okay. Now, <clears throat> one thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to sit here and listen to this kind of gibberish, okay? That's not, I'm not going to waste my time doing it. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Now listen, it's my, I'm going to start talking okay, and you're going to start listening. Okay. All right. I'm going to be point blank with you, pal. Right now. Your hind end is the one that's hanging over the edge, and Ryan could care less about it. Okay. Okay? Do you understand me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, you better start thinking very clearly. Okay. Because it's you that is on this chopping block. Okay. Am I clear yes. to you? Yes. Now. Do we need to go by or go back and go through this 
step by step? No. Well, I think we do, and that's what we're going to do. And I don't want to hear, oh, all of a sudden I just think I'm going to fabricate all this. And, uh, well, I don't no. Know. What I want to hear is exactly what Ryan told you, because that's what's going to keep you in a position to where you're not going to be the sole individual out here responsible for what happened to Kent. Okay. Okay? Yeah. I can't be any more clear to you than that. I understand. And you need to understand it. This is what bothers me. And you need to understand it. Okay. We're going to start back at the club. Whose idea was it to go get money because you wanted drinks, you wanted dope, or whatever you wanted? I wanted to go home. That was Ryan's idea. Ryan's idea. And the best of my knowledge, yes. I don't want to even hear whose idea, or best of my knowledge, whose idea was it? It was Ryan's idea. Ryan's idea. And what did he tell you? That we need some more money for drinks and the sister wouldn't give us any more money. Okay. And he said, we're going to do what about it? We're going to rob somebody. You're going to rob somebody. And so that led up to you and him leaving together? Yes. And you went to where? We went to the Tribune building. Well, before that, you went where? We went to his car. To his car, which was parked where? Down whatever street that is that by Georgia Line. Where we drove through earlier, you and I and the other two detectives, yeah. on, on First Street. It was parked alongside the street. And you went there for what reason? To get something out of his car. Get yeah. something out to, of his car. To get a weapon out of his car. To get a weapon out of his In car. Case what we try to do. Turn Whose to idea turn was it to go to the car to get a weapon out of the car? It was his. His idea. Yes. And how did he articulate that to you? Basically, that we're young, we're in high school, boy, if we just go and try to rob someone just regularly without anything. So you're young, you're afraid you get because you're not a big stature, and you wanted to go to the car to get something out of the car, a weapon. Yes. In order to do what with it? If it came down to it. If it came down to it. To beat someone with it. To beat someone with it. To possibly beat them. To death. To death? Hopefully. Hopefully? Hopefully not, no. I mean, hopefully it wouldn't come to that. But you went there with the knowledge yes. of getting a weapon, and it could come to that. And it did. And it did come to that. Yes. And who took the weapon out of the car? All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, if you want to implant memory in somebody, this is a hell of a way to do it. You put them under pressure, you get right in their face, even when they're friendly, his legs are still spread, you're right in there, you're driving, driving, driving raising those stress hormones brain is turning off remember the brain turns off in the order it came online so it turns off the last thing that developed first meaning our prefrontal cortex and all of our thinking fancy brain starts to turn off and the animal brain takes over to look out for us and protect us but if you could see this kid's eyes or pupils are probably dilated yeah i can't see him well enough to tell all those pieces that i would like from fight or flight but once you're in that fight or flight in that limbic brain everything i'm saying to you is registering in a different way and he is very specific in his language could all be innocuous could not be trying to inject doesn't matter you're still injecting and when the guy says the right words he even goes back at him and reconfirms those words that's a recipe for disaster he makes me think of my cousin vinny guy the attorney on my cousin vinny when he goes identical, when you know he's making back the same point the person said. You listen to those things and listen to this cadence, the pitch, everything he does, he's downward telling as he goes in. This is locking stuff down in that guy's brain. He even tells him which street by name, instead of that street we went down today, which street by name. I, look, if I were trying to set a false confession up, I couldn't do a better job. Now, did they do it intentionally? That's for the jury to figure out somewhere else. Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah. The detective, he's telling Chuck what he wants to hear, what the detective wants to hear. He's just like you just said, he's telling him what he wants him to say and what he wants him to hear, what he wants to hear from him. That's not the way you do it. And then he scoots up real close and starts in with this, this, you know, TV show thing he's doing. I don't know what he's doing in there. There's no reason to be doing that at all. Not even a little bit. And he's being, oh, here's what we're going to do. And the kid, look at his body language. 
he's wide open. He's still, he's still in that open. I'm listening. I'm like, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing, I'm not being deceptive. I'm not, I'm just listening. There's not, there's, this is so, it, these things just butt up against each other so hard. Anybody that would have watched this, I think from a, from a perspective that we have and, and saw that, or just another detective from, you know, an older guy would have seen that and gone, oh, dude, this is not, this is not right. And he would have said, you're doing this wrong. And he would have gone, he would have gone upstairs. He would have gone above the guy and said, you, you need to get this guy retrained. This is ridiculous. This is, this is out of hand. I, 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 I get to watch what I say. Chase, what do you got? I trained an entire police department of detectives in Alabama. And one of those detectives was, I don't know, 28, 29, the younger, on the younger side. And I said, uh, we were on a lunch break. And I said, where did you get your interrogation training before all of this? And she said, well, just watching Law and Order. Oof. It sounds oh. like it. And what I thought was that was uncommon. It's far more common uh, now that I've been around uh, than you might imagine. So that might be what we're seeing in some of these clips. And what we're seeing here in this video is not subtle in any way. And it it was upsetting to watch. It made me upset. Uh, when he's saying, I don't, don't want to hear any of this to the best of my knowledge stuff, I cannot imagine a jury admitting this or this contributing to any kind of conviction. I can't imagine. It's the worst I've ever heard. He's instructing a person on how to answer questions and not at all after the truth. This is desperation for confession. So he's walking him into these narratives. I was checking to see if I was frozen there. Uh, with each leading question, and only allowing agreement with him. I cannot believe this is allowed in court. In my interrogation training, I have an entire section that's literally titled How to Create False Confessions. I have that in my training so that anyone who's ever gone through my course will never be able to say they got a false confession on accident. If they do what I showed them on that slide or on those several slides, then I instantly proved beyond a doubt that they knew that it leads to a false confession. There's a lot of training out there that has a couple lists of what people shouldn't do, but I like to really throw it in people's face so there's no escape from being able to say they were well informed that their behavior might lead to a false confession, which is really what we're seeing here. We're seeing a recipe for false confession. We're seeing high authority, over usage of authority, uh, overusing or abusing trust. And we're on the other side, we're seeing a person who's fantasy prone, highly suggestible, young, impressionable, and already coming in there talking about memory problems. And a lot of these, I've seen interrogations where they manufacture memory deficits, where they manufacture deficits in memory and awareness of deficits in memory just to get someone to start questioning their own. Uh, and this is kind of down that line. And I don't think these people meant to harm anybody. I think that they thought this was the job that they were doing. Maybe this was even, and I've seen it before, I promise you, this was maybe part of the training they received. I don't know for sure. Greg? Mark. Correct. Mark or Scott. That's right. Yes. Been. It's me. It's me. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, listen, uh, nobody, nobody means to end up like this. Nobody means to go into the circus, but sometimes you wake up, uh, you know, the next day and you find you've got a shovel in your hand and you're around the back of an elephant and, and there you are. You've joined the circus. To your point, Scott, um, you know, this car uh, analogy, uh, he has got a car. It's, it's one of those clown circus cars. The wheels fall off, you know, the engine steams, three of them get out. I mean, it's a, it's now a complete clown show. He is the boss clown. He's what we call the Auguste clown. He's the person who thinks they're somebody of status, but really they have nothing. He's a, he's a pound shop cop in this 
situation. And in front of him is, is this little clown that we call the Zanny, the Zany, who's who's wide eyed and innocent and has no idea what's going on. And, and it's now impro night because what's happening is, is we got the, the interrogator here putting out an option, an idea. The the subject finishes the sentence. The next per the, the the interrogator then picks up on that and builds again. It's just they're finishing each other's sentences. They're evolving now together. This improvised idea of what might have gone on. It's yeah, it's a complete circus for me uh, at this point. Uh, I like a circus, but it has to be in the right right place out in a field somewhere you know away from everything you can go you, you buy a ticket you can go and visit it's all a lot of fun and then you go home uh you know that circus shouldn't be in your public uh institutions especially ones that are designed to protect you and not not harm you in any way so uh it's a, it's tough that you see this kind of um behavior clownish behavior inside this situation uh that's all i got on that one yeah, I agree with you. I think they should be hanging wallpaper in, in the bathroom at a gas station out near the airport. One of those tape replays. And you need to understand it. Okay. We're going to start back at the club. Whose idea was it to go get money because you wanted drinks, you wanted dope, or whatever you I wanted? I wanted to go home. That was Ryan's idea. Ryan's idea. And the best of my knowledge, yes. I don't want to even hear whose idea or best of my knowledge, whose idea was it? It was Ryan's idea. Ryan's idea. And what did he tell you? That we need some more money for drinks and the sister wouldn't give us any more money. Okay. And he said, we're going to do what about it? We're going to rob somebody. You're going to rob somebody. And so that led up to you and him leaving together? Yes. And you went to where? We went to the Tribune building. Well, before that, you went where? We went to his car. To his car? Which was parked where? Down whatever street that is that by Gordon's on. Where we drove through earlier, you and I and the other two detectives, yeah. on on First Street. Mm -hmm. It was parked alongside the street. And you went there for what reason? To get something out of his car. Get yeah. something out to, of the car. To get a weapon out of his car. To get a weapon out of his In car. Case what we try to do. Turn Whose to idea turn was it to go to the car to get a weapon out of the car? It was his. His idea. Yes. And how did he articulate that to you? Basically, that we're young, we're in high school. If we just go try to rob someone just regularly without anything. So you're young. You're afraid you get because you're not a big stature, and you wanted to go to the car to get something out of the car, a weapon. Yes. In order to do what with it? If it came down to it. If it came down to it. To beat someone with it. To beat someone with it. To possibly beat them. To death. To death? Hopefully. Hopefully? Hopefully not, no. I mean, hopefully it wouldn't come to that. But you went there with the knowledge yes. of getting a weapon, and it could come to that. And it did. And it did come to that. Yes. And who took the weapon out of the car? Just one more thing. All right, Mark, how's it looking to you so far at this point? What do you think you've seen? Well, we've never seen anything like this. I mean, you know, on the show. So it's good to 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 get through this one and 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 see it. You know, do go back, watch some of those uh breakdowns we've done on interrogations where, you know, they're they're brilliant interrogations. Uh you see some people who who maybe don't have so much training, but they're very, very self-aware, very aware of the situation, watching the person all the time, engaged, although they not, might not be super trained. They're engaged and they and they know they're in a in a uh, a difficult situation. They're trying to be professional within that situation. I unfortunately think we don't see as much of that as we should in this situation here. So we have had people on this show who have not been well trained, but they uh, uh, um, but they are well. I was going to say well intentioned. These people might be well intentioned. Um, but but they're not uh, well you know I think they're checking in with themselves more as to how well this might be going and monitoring the situation as it goes along. Uh, Chase, what do you see? If you're doing an interview, you need to seek the truth and you need to do it with empathy. One teaspoon of empathy 
would have helped a tremendous amount here and uh, would have gotten a, probably a lot more information out of these people. So doing it with empathy does not mean that I don't care. It doesn't mean I'm not trying to be Mr. Tough Guy or anything like that. I have a theory that's different than a lot of people. I personally believe if you know or feel like you're being interrogated, then I am doing an extremely poor job. I'm acting kind of like an amateur. It shouldn't know that it's happening. Uh, we definitely know it in, in these clips here. Greg? Yeah, let me tell you who the best interrogators on earth are. They're three-year-old. You know why? Because they want to know. They're asking you why because they want to know. This guy didn't want to know. They want to close this case. They don't want to know what's happening. If they did care, in my opinion, what would have happened is Chase comes in. He says, hey, I think I killed this guy. You know what my first question is? What do you mean you think you killed this guy? I would have gone from there. You mean you don't know? Okay, let's unpack this as we go. And then I would not have automatically said, since this guy thinks he may have killed someone, the other guy is automatically guilty. I think we see a lot of that. And I think that's a human mistake. It's a human mistake because you need closure. But that child would look at the other person, try to figure out what they're trying to tell them. And this is not going on here. When I teach people all the time to interrogate, I give them a very simple checklist of ways to know you're getting into a false confession. It's a simple one. The first thing you got to do when you go in is to protect all guilty knowledge. You cannot bleed any of it. And then you look for guilty knowledge in the person. And if they give you anything, you try to validate incorrect guilty knowledge at the same time. If I try to validate incorrect and you validate it, I know that we don't have the right guy. And then the third one is very simple. We know what confession looks like. Look, Mark, you were talking about people who innately have the ability the reason that they do is because it's human nature to want to know more about the other person, try to get the information and get to facts. We've created a lot of process around how to interrogate to be more effective and to be more rapid. But we've been doing this since Cain killed Abel. What happened? This is the way things go. So I think as we walk through this, if you can remember to look out for that body language and that deviation that you heard us talk in the past about chin dropping, closing body language, and then opening up, that's pre-confession body language. This guy came in and said, I think I did it. So we're going to beat him up, feed him some information, and then use him against his friend. I'm not a fan of this interrogation. I'm, I want to say it was training, poor training, poor knowledge, and reading wrong on both <laughs> kinds of read. Reading, I mean, the read method or read technique and reading body language. Scott, what do you got? Yeah. I, these guys make everybody look bad. They make everyone that's in law enforcement look bad. Look, at Everyone that's in the interrogation look bad when you don't do it right. It it doesn't it doesn't go well, and especially for these guys, it didn't because they ended up in prison, and they shouldn't have been. They shouldn't have been in prison. And if these guys had done just a little bit of real interrogation, as far as looking for the truth goes, then they wouldn't have had that problem because it takes one of them to go, "Hey, man, what about this? How did tell me about what happened then?" Like you were saying, Greg, you just go there and start, or you start over there. And they didn't do that. And it makes everybody look bad. But like I said before, I love the cops. I think they're awesome. They're, they, you know, it's, it's one of those things where if anything goes wrong, those are the, the people that show up and they'll, they'll make it right. They'll fix it for you. So they get a lot of bad rap from, from people who aren't good cops. And there, there are a few of those as well. But in this case, these guys didn't do it right. And they're, they're, Ignorance in how to do something correctly has cost these guys years and years of their lives. These young guys go into prison for years because these guys think they know everything. I, boy, I've just squatted all over these guys, but that's the way I feel about it. All right. I think this is another good, fellas, and we'll see you next time. So what do you got? <laughs>